Psychosis Podcast. This is episode 19. I'm your host, Strong Knots, and once again, you know what time of the year it is. Well, it's November now when we're posting this, but it was just Halloween. And every year we do our annual Halloween viewing show, but uh, we actually just dropped on the Video Psychosis YouTube page, it's also on our Facebook, a short horror film that we posted specifically for Halloween yesterday. This is being recorded on November 1st. Uh, So go to YouTube or Facebook, check out Video Psychosis, and see our short horror film, The Lonely Dream of Death. Check that out, The Lonely Dream of Death. It's only about five minutes, uh, sort of an abstract experimental horror short film. And one thing that we're going to be doing a little bit differently this year, uh, generally I try to only watch feature films for Halloween and discuss them, but uh, this year I kind of loosened up a little and watched quite a lot of short films. So I have about uh, 10, 11 or so shorts that I'm going to talk uh, exclusively about, and then I'm going to give you a list of the other stuff I watched. But we're actually going to kick off the show this year with a guest spot from our recurring friend Vince Inzunza talking about a very special 1994 short film that he watched. Hi, this is Vince Nzunza of Pacific North Weird, here with my review of Desert Spirits, a 1994 short film by writer-director Patrick McGuinn. This film has everything you could want. Two friends, a broke-down car, a desert, peyote, a mystical iguana, and more. The IMDb plot synopsis reads, Chris and Gordon, temporarily stranded in the desert when their car breaks down, decide to take peyote to kill some time. Unbeknownst to them, the cactus buttons they consume are tickets into another world, where lizards talk and demonic forces seek prey. And that pretty much sums it up. I watched this film twice in preparation for this review, and developed a casual fever of 101 degrees in between the two viewings. The night before the second watch, I had a dream that was in a forest full of dozens of sleeping bodies, curled up in various poses under the trees. It took me a few moments before I realized that each of the sleeping bodies were, in fact, me, and that I was in an astral form and had to choose which body to possess and continue my journey of sleep. However, I was given the knowledge that all but one of my sleeping selves would inevitably lead me to dying in my sleep. Luckily, I chose to inhabit the correct body, and I woke up in the morning and decided to watch Desert Spirits again. In Desert Spirits, The act of peyote breaks down the walls of perception and of worlds, and primordial forces are unleashed, one of which inhabits the body of an unsuspecting desert dweller trying to enjoy a bowl of porridge. Isn't that how it always is? Another primordial entity takes the form of an iguana named Nori and talks like that one guy in college who's really into Jim Morrison, but with the voice of a dungeon master burning the midnight oil at Denny's. I don't want to spoil too much of this strange cinematic trip. This is the kind of film that makes me want to save a few thousand dollars and make a film of my own. If you do watch it, and I encourage you to do so, watch it like you're 22 years old and you don't have a job to go to in the morning. Then, grow up and watch it again. So that was Vince Inzunza on Patrick McGuinn's Desert Spirits, and I couldn't agree more. It's a bad trip with a happy ending. And I'm going to start off with my list of the short films I watched for Halloween. We're going to kick off here with The Red Spectre from 1907. This is a French short film, kind of reminiscent of Melier. You know, hand-painted colors, devil magic trickery. I mean, there's not really... If I were to tell you the plot of this, it would probably take about as long as actually watching the film, so just watch it. It's on YouTube. Two directors on this one. Co-director Ferdinand Zecca, you know, over 150 credits to his name. Now, the other director, uh, Segundo de Chamon, you know, if you thought Zecca had an impressive roster, this de Chamon, he has 233 director credits from between 1901 to 1923, and he's got at least uh, 190 director of photography credits. So, check this out. Pretty fun. Uh, The Haunted House from 1921, and this is a Buster Keaton short film that he co-directed with Edward H. Klein. And I guess the best way to describe The Haunted House here, this is basically like a live-action Scooby-Doo before Scooby-Doo. I mean, there's literally, there's several gags lifted from it for that show, Uh, the least of which includes, you know, running in place on the turntable in the floor, uh, trick stairs, people running in and out of doorways. Uh, There's a great, great part in here where, uh, you know, these skeletons, quote-unquote, assemble a living man from, like, blocks and pieces. You know, there's a really great stairway to heaven dream yeah i highly recommend this absolutely hilarious about 20 20 minutes or so total breeze to get through watch the haunted house that's great 
Next up, it's The Fall of the House of Usher from 1928. No, not the Jean Epstein version. This is directed by Weber and Watson, the same year, of course. And uh, this is just amazing. I highly recommend watching this. It's on YouTube. There's actually a channel called The Last Theater on the Left that sort of uh, describes the background of it, how it was made, the impact it would have. And I highly recommend watching that copy of the film. Uh, just incredible. There's a heavy expressionism influence here, you know. We've got this prism trick intro with a book page. Uh, you know, there's coffin superimpositions, clever use of visual repetition, and visual onomatopoeia, you know, slow motion, shadow play, Dutch angles, lens refractions. Uh, really, really cool. There's reverse motion. Yeah, for 1928, this is amazing. This is, uh, ba it's basically just a, a short experimental version of the Poe story, so if you're familiar with that story, I think you'll enjoy it even more, and if you aren't, I don't think it really matters, because visually, this, this is a knockout. Watch that. Next up, we're going to jump way, way ahead from 1928 to 1984 and discuss a short anthology horror film by German director Jörg Buttgereit called Horror Heaven. I was not aware that uh, Gazora, the beast from the depths of the earth, was actually part of of this anthology film, and I watched that and really enjoyed it. It's a sort of a kaiju parody, and I ended up finding out that there was this, like, 30-minute anthology horror short that Budgerite made, and uh, that was just a part of it, so of course I had to see it. Jorg himself actually bookends this as, as a classic book reading narrator, which is like the refuge of every idealist anthology horror writer. You know, when you don't know how to how to weave the segments together, just have a guy reading a book to somebody. And so that's your gear. Now these stories are not really stories in the traditional sense. Some of them are more just like quick gags. You know, uh, the first one's about a mummy. Second story, Frankenstein. Of course, the third story, The Mummy's Revenge. Story four, Captain Berlin versus Hyzar. After that, you have the Gazora story, which I mentioned before. Last story in here is called Cannibal Girl. Not for everybody. I enjoyed it. Next up, we're going to talk a little bit about Murder Drone, and we're going to start with Murderous Follies from 1984. Like I said, Murder Drone, this is a somewhat newer sub-sub-genre, basically to describe films like uh, Ogroff, Mad Mutilator, uh, Bloodstream by Michael J. Murphy, things like that, and these are films comprised mostly of walking and killing with lo-fi music, heavy blood and gore, and a sort of dreamlike trance of a tone. I, you know, I don't know, I think, I think we tend to over categorize things in today's world, but uh, I'm on board with Murder Drone. That's that's the world I want to live in. So Murderous Follies, this is a great example of that sub-sub-genre, and uh, the score kind of warbles as this stalker follows a girl at the beach. Meanwhile, a narrator only provides unnecessary dates for the action. Like, the only thing the narrator says the whole time is like, Friday, November 3rd. You know, it's like, we don't, <laughs> don't really need to know that. Just to, somebody just walking around killing women. Chainsaw disembowelment. There's an axe murder. A head in a vice. Finally, the film culminates with this ridiculous dramatic zoom that drives home the killer's identity in a sort of twist reveal. And then the story takes on a, a proto-killing spree angle complete with zombie revenge through prior weaponry used throughout the film. And you can't hate anything that ends with a pun. Uh, now she will live her death to the fullest. Yes, Murderous Follies. Excellent. Check it out. Next up, Gaki Dama, also known as Demon Within from 1985. This is a Japanese short film by director Masayoshi Tsukita. He actually also wrote Shuji Teriyama's Throw Away Your Books, Rally in the Streets, and the co-writer on this one, Atsushi Yamatoya. He was one of many writers on Seijun Suzuki's Branded to Kill, but he also worked on scripts like Norifumi Suzuki's Star of David, Beauty Hunting, and Koji Wakamatsu's Violent Virgin. This is a nasty little short film. You know, if you enjoy stuff like Guzu, The Thing Forsaken, by God, you've got to see this. It uh, starts off with this ghost photographer on a train with another man discussing his weird career. And so these two guys go out into the forest and they're taking photos of light orbs that are eating raw meat dangling from a tree. But the assistant guy gets infected. And there's a really gross scene. He's got this thing in his nose at dinner. He's got all these mouth sores. You know, he's got more mouth sores than Brian Wilson. Uh, there's a good tub drowning psych out and a return to the womb. You gotta go back to where you came from sometimes. So, home sweet home. And, uh, interesting Interestingly enough, the Gakidama almost sort of acts like a drug on its victims. Uh, not unlike uh, Aylmer from Brain Damage, I thought. Check that out. 
Next up, it's a little short from the UK called The Vacancy from 1985. Now, the director of this, Brian Davies, he actually has several short films available on YouTube, uh, including The Exhumation and many more, and you should check them out because this is really great, sort of under-the-radar backyard horror. Uh, this guy uh, was really passionate, made a lot of really interesting films, and they're all up there for free, so check them out. Support the independents, you know? Uh, these two sisters in their trailer are having tea time, waiting for job calls, and uh, meanwhile, at Lipton Supermarket, a man is nabbed for awkwardly trying to steal toilet paper. But to make a long story short, this asylum parolee gets denied a job at the supermarket, and this is supposed to make you think he's the killer. And uh, all these people, including the two sisters from the trailer, come in to do nighttime job interviews in the locked store, and some masked man picks them off one by one with meat hooks, electricity, and booze carts. Honestly, the hideous sweaters in here are more appalling than the minuscule amount of blood and gore that Brian Davies gives us, but this is really fun. Uh, this is also one one of many movies I watched this month with puking in it. Whole lot of puking going on. Still pretty hilarious. And uh, like I said, yeah, check this out. Really uh, under the radar. Good fun. Next up, it's Scarlet Fry's Horrorama from 1989. Now, just like Horror Heaven, this is another short film anthology horror film. The, you know, when you would watch an anthology horror film, presumably you got like, what, four 20-minute stories, something like that, but this is like a 30-minute short, so you've got like six five-minute shorts instead. Uh, so just like Horror Heaven, not a, not exactly, uh, the film, you know, the stories aren't exactly about plot here. It's just about quick fun. It's like, this is basically like fast food. Uh, there's no other way to say it. This is just dirt cheap, do-it-yourself goofball filmmaking at its most absurd and hilarious. Uh, the first story, in the sack, you got a collar-popping car thief named Josh who holds his blind date at knife point for an over-the-pants blowjob, but she stabs him in the dick. Very similar to the final story from... <laughs> Horror Heaven. Uh, second story in here, Manwich. A couple of sexless lumberjacks take a lunch break. Uh, one of them's complaining about his wife's food prep and he ends up eating his co-worker. That's it. Story three, Salt With That Deer. Another unflattering representation of married life where the shrewish badgering wife is bludgeoned by newly liberated hubby with a giant pepper grinder after she calls him a fat wad. Fourth story, New Wave Zombie. Woman visits her husband's grave and his zombie eats her. <laughs> That's it. Uh, fifth story, I don't remember the title of this one, but a guy finds a gun in a parked trash can and ends up saving his girlfriend from this pencil-stabbing maniac, but in a twist, he kills his girlfriend anyway and drives off victoriously while Baby Got Back by Sir mix a -Lot plays for a moment. Last story, called R.I.P., and it's basically a wife threatening her closeted gay husband as he tries to mow the lawn, and she goes from threat directly into action and decapitates him. There's really no story to this one either. Uh, there's kind of a running theme in these stories, actually. It's all just about the domestic hell. You know, so Scarlet Fry's trying to tell you, don't get married. <laughs> So yeah, Scarlet Fry's Horrorama, check that out, pretty funny. Next up here, we're going to talk about a really obscure little Brooklyn, New York short called Shock, Shock, Shock from 1987, 1989, somewhere around there. This is a really interesting little film, kind of a spoofy, cliche compendium of action, adventure, sci-fi, and horror. Ultimately, I mean, this is just a loving homage to the serials of days long past, you know, not unlike uh, Futuropolis or uh, Rocket Boy from 1989. And uh, the plot, if you want to call it that, revolves around an insane asylum escapee and the search for the mystic star of Bartos. Rhino released this film on VHS, but to me it felt kind of closer to something like the uh, the homespun madness of Film Threat video. Uh, here's a fun fact about the movie. This was actually James Gandolfini's first screen role as an orderly in the asylum. Although you'd never know it's him because he's framed pretty much entirely in shadows like side portraits, so it's impossible to tell. But, but yes, uh, Tony Soprano is in this movie, and he does get karate chopped. Co-written and co-directed by Todd Rutt and Arne McConnell. Uh, it was shot by Todd. It was edited by Arne. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to see this through a friend's VHS. A friend of mine had a copy of this film that he loaned me. It's really, really hard to track down. It's never been released on DVD or Blu-ray. Just see if you can track down the tape and watch it the legit way. Shock, shock, shock. Pretty fun. Check it out. So the last short film we're going to talk about here before I give you the list of the other crud I watched there. This might be my favorite short that I watched of any of them. Debbie Does Damn Nation from 1999. Ultra grainy 16mm black and white lo-fi adventure horror epic full of kinky sex and gruesome violence. If that doesn't sell you, 
There's the door. There's a two-headed man, a naked sword fight, not like the not like the Eastern Promises kind. Uh, tragically dubbed William Smith as a traitor locked in battle with his cohort over the devil's horns for control. One of our favorites on the show, the legendary Charles Pinion, as a character named DeMarco. Uh, you got a mousetrap-cheeked man and the scene stealer. Total highlight of the movie. There's this low voice mumbler sort of monster guardian named Mongor. This fucking guy. Made me laugh so hard when I first watched the film that I, I had to rewind it and watch that scene like three more times. What's, what's that name? Oh, you can't come here right now. Greg is busy. Uh, he's running the war right now. You gotta come back later. Get out of here. Yeah. Baby can stay, but it's hard to get with me. Buck you up. What's up with that? I said, back. Get, get back. Fuck you up, man. What's up with this? I know crazy, man. I know karate. I would chop your ass up, motherfucker. Down! Hey! Get away from me. Debbie Does Damnation. Check this out. This is also on YouTube somehow <laughs> and uh, the making of it's pretty incredible supposedly there's a triple x version out there since uh, the producer slain wayne also made adult films yeah watch the making of after the short because they show you how it was done it really is a labor of love uh, a lot of cardboard props utilized and it really drives home the importance of black and white and set design you know when you're making these kind of films like this debbie does damnation excellent check it out so that's just a quick run through on some of my favorite short films I watched this year for Halloween, but uh, here's some other things I watched. Prelude from 1927, I'm Afraid to Go Home in the Dark from 1930, Boo from 1932, also The Great Fear from 1958, Ursula from 1961, Mrs. Winchester's House from 1963, and the next one that we're going to go into here, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge from 1964. Actually released in 1961. This is the TV re-edit for The Twilight Zone that was released in 64. And that's going to bring us to our next guest, so go ahead. This is Jason Mortensen from Crypticon Seattle. An Occurrence on Owl Creek Bridge. I fucking love this episode. It's my favorite episode of The Twilight Zone. And I know it's not technically a real episode of the twilight zone they just repurposed it into an episode of the twilight zone because it won best short at Cannes in 1962 and it had a good twilight zone feel but this short story has been made into film and into anthologies and into episodes and even a fucking bon jovi movie or uh, music video of all fucking things this story is so great and i think it really hits me hard in like an emotional place the idea of um escaping in your head and trying to escape in an outer body way for the the people that you love and I mean, it can be interpreted so many different ways, and I don't want to ruin anybody's idea of what the story means to them. But to me, it, it's it's poetry. And especially Enrico's um, version, which is what we see in The Twilight Zone, um, it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. And this is saying a lot, but by far my favorite episode of The Twilight Zone. Move on through the rest of the shorts here. We got The Beast from the Egg, 1968. Uh, that's the Chiodo brothers when they were very, very young, way, way before Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Also watched The Haunted House from 1971. This is supposed to be an educational short film, though I really couldn't tell you what the lesson was. I think it's... Uh, basically just bedwetting shaming? I don't know. See for yourself. It's on YouTube. Also, The Woman Who Powders Herself from 1972. This is a really, really creepy uh, little French film. Definitely recommended to you if you enjoy uh, stuff like 1065, Begotten, or David Lynch's The Grandmother. Very similar in tone to that stuff. Also saw The Haunted Mouth from 1974. This is a uh, <laughs> toothpaste-produced educational short about brushing your teeth, narrated by Cesar Romero, of all people, currently available on YouTube. Also saw Attack of the Helping Hand from 1979, directed by Scott Spiegel, uh, not all that long before Intruder. I believe Bruce Campbell helped shoot it, and Sam Raimi acts in it. And yes, it's exactly what it looks like. It's a, it's a short film about the hamburger helper gone berserk. 
Also saw Fisheye from 1980. This is another Yugoslavian cartoon, but this one blew the great fear out of the water. This is one of my favorite things I saw this month. Watch Fisheye. This is incredible. Basically, it's about a sort of fishing village where the fish get revenge. Uh, maybe not unlike the Junji Ito story, but uh, excellent stuff. The animation is mind-blowing. Watch Fisheye. That's on YouTube. Next up... It, it, hold on, hold on. Shut the fuck up for a second. Hey, can I just... No, shut the fuck up. Fine, go ahead. Fuck it. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. This is Jason from Crypticon again. Hey, did you just say the dummy? The the short from 1982? I never got the chance, mate. You cut me off. I have to put in my two cents about this one. So going down your list, when I was looking at what you had been watching this month, this one stood out to me probably the most because when I was a kid, probably around six or seven... And this was, um, I don't know, around 1990. I was born in 84. They would still play this short on USA, you know, Friday, Saturday nights um, in October around Halloween. And I had watched it a couple of times. I'm six years old, and this is around the time that your parents start making you take showers instead of baths. And, you know, you start taking care of yourself on your own. And there's a scene in the short where the dummy slides a cleaver underneath the bathroom door. You know, being a being a kid that basically was allowed to do whatever the fuck I wanted, watch whatever the fuck I wanted, I, uh, I wasn't afraid of much. And I think this scene really stuck with me. Every time I was in the shower, I would wait for a, a meat cleaver to come from underneath the door because of the short. Now, I know that you can find it on YouTube these days, I definitely suggest you check it out. I mean, there had been a few puppet horror movies at that time, but this one was probably the only one that was genuinely creepy instead of corny. I think this one is the only one that actually had an effect on me. So check it out. Sorry, you can go back to talking. Yeah, shut the fuck up. Okay, that was Jason again about the dummy. Great stuff. Yes, you can see that on YouTube. One you can't see on YouTube, the next one on my list, Mr. Pumpkin from 1986. You can also find it on a website. And what is the name of that website, folks? TheTexasArchive.org. Uh, next up, Runaway Brain from 1995. Cannibal Cult from 1999. Next up, please speak continuously and describe your experiences as they come to you. And yes, that's quite a mouthful. White Echo from 2019. This is a short by Chloe Sevigny, the great actress, of course. Gonna finish up the shorts list here with a friend of mine's film, Night Night from 2021. Directed by Zach Murphy, a fellow tape head. A uh, good guy short film he did with his family so very fun there watched that on facebook and that was uh, cool to see so that's going to wrap up the list of short films that i watched and we've already heard from a couple guests here we're going to take a segue here before we go into the feature films and uh and have a chat with filmmaker chris a frieri so let's hear what he has to say as we talk about some of his earlier work i guess we'll start off here uh do you uh do you care to introduce yourself how would you how would you introduce yourself to the people? <laughs> uh, well, I'm mean, I'm Chris Fieri of Ghost Limb Films, and uh, you know, I dedicated my life to all to all of this. So <laughs> that's my that's my credential, basically. Uh, you founded Ghost Limb Films. You started that, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It was uh, you know, I mean, it goes back a long ways. It's really like I shot the first one in '83, so it's you know getting on to 40 years. So. It started out with a um, borrowing my friend's father's like eight millimeter camera. Sure, that's what we shot our first thing on. And then at some point, after they, you know, that summer, I ended up getting a camera in Times Square, a two hundred dollar, uh, like a really high tech, or like high tech, but a very nice, you know, a nice camera at the time. But the video cameras were in, so they're trying to like make Super Eight cameras smaller and like try to make them more appealing. But I bought that uh, then and. Uh, and carried on from there. You know. Well, but aside from just uh, the, the the films, Ghost Limb films, you helped found uh, By Our Records. I really didn't like, I wouldn't say that, like, uh, but uh, but I was part of that for, for a bunch of years. Uh, oh, okay. That name of that label, um, the group Adrenaline OD, they put out a 45, it's like, uh, like barbecue. Yeah. And, and that was like, they thought that up. Wouldn't be the name I would use for a record. 
correct if I implement that or something a little more sinister than that, but like, you know, yeah. but then we adopted it, they're like, you know, Jim and Lenny were really the guys that like picked that up and started putting records out. I came in at some point, probably in 1980, me and this cat Aaron, uh, who I still see around the... Uh, you mentioned Adrenaline OD. There's actually some of their uh, music in uh, one of your one of your first films, uh, yeah, Der Fledermaus. We used, yeah. we used their uh, we used a little bit of their uh, a little clip of it. You know. So you said you borrowed this uh, super the Super Eight camera. I'm curious, is that what you made your first film with, Cemetery Meat Crimes from '83? Yeah, that was actually an eight, a straight eight millimeter camera. It was something you, you shot one end of it, and then you had to flip the uh, you had to get you know put it in the dark and flip the roll over shoot it back the other way and then they would slice the thing down the middle <laughs> and send it back to you as one thing oh man but it was like you know a funny system but it was like a really you know an old camera from the 50s probably the camera was from but uh, no really it's kind it's kind of you to watch you know because like uh, <laughs> it's great you know it's great because i'm you know i've been working at it a long time so it's a nice you to watch this stuff and i'm glad that you're enjoying it and, uh, the uh yeah, the old films, though, when I see them now, and it's like, uh, they, you know, they're um, not even The Mummy, but like The War Patrons and The Flader Maz. Mm-hmm, sure. And, 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 and Cemetery Meat Crimes, I, 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 I tried to cut it like now, like with a, uh, like a couple, for the last few years I've started, it's like, it's really, you can't really cut it into much, but little clips of it work great, you know, so I, I use them in, in, in Sweet Lorraine's Diary. But those films, like, uh, those were like, uh, when you're doing those when you're young, it's like, you know, you can't replace the feeling that went into it. Oh, sure, now, like, like the like, energy, you know, yeah. Older, it's cynical. I was cynical then, but, like, now it's like a different <laughs> thing. But, like, you know, but, but you know, but older, and it's like, you know, it's just, you're more conscious of things. Where then it was like, you know, didn't really, <laughs> I didn't care who was watching. You know? <laughs> Back then it was just so, make, it, make it and go and see what we got, yeah. Yeah, like sure. who, you know, and the more offensive it all is, or you know, it's like annoying anyone, uh, well, it's like all the better on that I'm actually doing something good. Well, I think uh, one thing I really like about your work from what I've seen so far, uh, and it starts with Dear Flader Mouse, but you also see it in um, uh, I Was a Teenage Mummy. I like that you kind of pay homage to classic horror filmmaking, like especially in Dear Flader Mouse with the, uh, the overlays and the newsreel footage. Uh, it's not unlike something you'd see in maybe like oh, Supernatural yeah. or something like that, you know? I, gr- I grew up in front of a television as a kid. <laughs> And the first love really was like those Frankenstein movies when I yeah. saw those and like the Wolfman I was in love with and all that stuff, the Universal. And I kind of graduated to like Warner Brothers films, but I watched I watched a lot of that and that, that was the stuff uh, that really inspired it. And what happened with, with when I really actually started shooting was when it was like the advent of like when uh, video, the video stores were opening. Sure. So now you can go in here and all these things that weren't on television and all these other things you never even heard of or didn't know about or like... Yeah. completely clueless about you know, suddenly the out in the open there yeah well i think it's i think it's pretty obvious uh from i mean there's a scene in der flader mouse where you look on the wall and there's posters for i bury the living and this really uh, ob- yeah, obscure yeah. uh mamie van yeah, doren yeah. movie the night the navy yeah. versus the night monster so it seems pretty obvious that you uh, have a deep interest in yeah, horror and it's yeah, not just the classics you know hang out for sure yeah and there's one hanging there from like the was like the dead kennedys at the uh <laughs> at the yeah. beacon theater Nice. And uh, that was another thing that that really got me started too. It all coincided with like the punk scene, and uh, you saw you could do things like for really on the cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Those were fueled by cannabis. <laughs> they were like funded by cannabis. So, uh, Very nice. Know, <laughs> well, uh, I like another thing that I think is really interesting about uh, Der Flader Mouse. Now, I don't know if you particularly uh, prescribe to the auteur theory. It's uh, it can be hit or miss for sure. But uh, take a take a look at Der Flader Mouse, and you'll see some recurring themes in your other films, like necrophilia and puking. Those make a first time <laughs> appearance. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. Yeah, there's a bit of necrophilia, like a lot of fetishism, and uh, it's like it's all. Out and it's funny and it runs right through into Sweet Lorraine. Sweet Lorraine's diary, 30 years, 40 freaking years go by, and it's like always the same stuff going on. All the things that make life worth living there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and there was always a uh, an anti, like an anti-fascist, anti, um, or bringing down like uh, bringing down like uh, the bully down a little peg. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll probably try and push her into um, the Orbitrons. Talk a little bit about that. And there's actually uh, an actress uh, from Dare Flader Mouse who plays, I believe, the vampire woman in here, and that's uh, Daivahasi. Okay. Daivahasi. She's uh, somebody who would go back. 
back with really right from the beginning of this. He was like kind of amused in many ways. So really, uh, so it's funny. Yeah, so she had a big effect in my life really in many ways. In fact, she way later, like down the road, maybe in the middle nineties, introduced me to Frederick Zolo, who was the guy who ended up producing uh, producing Sweet Lorraine for me. Nice. So you know, it's like a long uh, long road with her. So yeah, she was like somebody I hung out with when we were kids, and uh, we made those early films together. Uh, yeah, and she ended up making she she ended up in one of Fred's films called uh, Lansky. She gets up there and belts out some song. I like her a lot in uh, in the Arbitrons. I think she's really good oh, in that. She's great. Yeah, it's uh, so basically <laughs> uh, for for anyone who's listening here, uh, a lot of the all these films we're talking about here you can find on Vimeo, and um, the Arbitrons is basically, I guess, the best way I would describe it. It's basically like a sort of psychotronic sexploitation comedy, but it's got sort of a subversive gender twist on the old sci-fi movie fifties cliches. And here, uh, Diva is this like aggressive, oversexed. Like woman captain of the ship who domineers the emasculated man, and she abducts this biker for sex experiments. So this one, you, well, yeah. You, yeah, you, you, you I sh- was reaching for it, you know. With this <laughs> I was like, you know, I had to do something. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to. So that was it. Yeah, it's funny, and I, I laughed because you know I didn't, you know, I don't want to watch them, but like since I've been recutting, like fiddling around with these things in the last few years, I'm looking at them. I'm like, fucking Christ, what did I spare my? I didn't spare myself like uh, any degradation. I did all of it. You know, it was really nothing left. You know, like they, they did everything they could, and it, it's funny. It's like it's on and on. It, it's fantastic, really. It was not. It was like it went over pretty well, really, when it came. I didn't play anywhere. This is the thing. It was like no, no real like film festivals for that kind of film. It was like there just wasn't that much around. That was my block. It's got a filmmaker like every other every other apartment. It's got a filmmaker in it, but like. Uh, in those days, it wasn't really like that. So like it, when it played, it always went over well. And to this day, really, and it's, I said it played a couple of weeks ago, it still goes over very well. You know, it's like, you know, either the, I, I always think, well, maybe they're laughing at me and not with me, but either way, it doesn't matter to me. But they always get a laugh at, they laugh at the right places. The guy playing the head cop. Yeah. I mean, the, the people in the film, like, you know, Diva, all of those people, I knew them before her even. Like, I went back to them to, from grade school, some of them, uh, the guy who's the head cop, he went on to, to a career in law enforcement. Oh, really? He is it, as a lieutenant. Yeah. Is this is this the same guy who plays the the creepy sandwich eating gym coach in Teenage Mummy? Yeah, he is. yeah okay. <laughs> so Kubosh, yeah, dude, that oh man. He's pretty fucking good. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's he's that, that, that guy. That guy is hilarious. That he's good in that one. And he was stealing. The, he said without him, Diva would have been like the queen of the movie. But like those. Cops were like, yeah, kind of like steal the movie and then carry it. They're carrying it on their shoulders. <laughs> Talking about his mom in the toilet and everything. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I didn't, I didn't have to write that. He wrote that stuff. Oh, there. <laughs> was that so? That was that like ad libbed, or he did just like prep something? You think or? No, it was like lines. That, the, the, it's funny with those two cops. A lot of their shtick was like out of stuff like conversations I'd had with them and like you know sure. the stuff that was coming out of their mouths uh, you know I, I strung it together for them and they're you know all too happy to read it and uh, you know so they played it up to the hill but those two guys are like uh, you know <laughs> they weren't too far off from their characters yeah I mean not like they're not real but parasitist or whatever <laughs> <laughs> paracomedians basically yeah. Bob Reese I went to uh, grade school he, he was a year behind me but I remember we I think uh, one of the yeah. one, one of the funniest uh, parts of uh, Orbitron's for sure. I love that scene where he describes proper go-go bar etiquette. That's a great scene. Oh, I was Zenon and poor Zenon, but this is the most beautiful guy. He he, he uh, took his own life in 2012. Mm. So he's like uh, he's been gone a while now. But he was a great person, and, and he uh, without him, I couldn't have uh, you know I, I really couldn't have made any of these films at all. Really. Uh, because he, he was he was carrying he was like my right arm uh, you know through all the years whether he was in them or not uh, you know he was like the driver he was like you know took care of the equipment he had like storage space for me where I could keep stuff and like uh, he was just a guy who was like a huge help to me and like really it, it was doing it out of love you know because he wasn't that making a hell of a lot of money or any money uh, mm-hmm. work. yeah that guy said and yeah he was great and his bit of, and that's once again it's another guy you know that's his shtick. <laughs> 
and I just put it, you know, I wrote it down and said, we'll do it all over again, just like you mean it. <laughs> Make it but do it with feeling, you know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he was great, and I love his line when he says, uh, Damn, Coupage, sure gets dark fast here. <laughs> yeah, right great stuff. Wood, you know? Great stuff. Yeah, and it's and it's uh, great you bring that up. I think the film definitely uh, takes influence from uh, Ed Wood and like Plan Nine and stuff like that. Definitely seems like a takeoff on that kind of stuff. Well, it's funny that you say it because I hadn't seen Plan Nine from Outer Space Land. Oh, really? In a lot of years, like hmm. twenty years, and I watched it recently. It was on television. Um, on, I was looking at it, going, Jesus, <laughs> what didn't I steal for the Orbitrons in this? <laughs> Other than like the smut part. Although I think it's a better movie in many ways. But, like you know, it moves a little faster. You know, it's blessedly a little shorter. It's like uh, aside from all like the other strange things that happen in it, it's like the plot's exactly. Uh, you know, it's almost like a carbon copy. Well, you but know, great, but it, Plan Nine doesn't have any urethra stabbing in it. You know. None of that action, but no, it's, a, it's, it's dull in many ways, you know. Just, no, uh, you know. no, no crucifixion pooping in that movie. Yes, and their <laughs> cops have uh, no personality between three or four of them, however many are there. Basically, how I got into uh, your films, and we talked about this a little bit on Facebook. I'll uh, sum it up here. Um, I had just, I had found out about this uh, 1963 film called "I Was a Teenage Mummy Online," yeah, and yeah, I and I thought yeah. it sounded pretty interesting. Looked it up, couldn't find it, and I found your film. And uh, <laughs> this is so embarrassing to admit, but I was watching your film, and I must have got about halfway through it before I realized it was not the 60s movie because I was thinking this is really self-aware for a, for an early <laughs> 60s movie. <laughs> You gotta be uh, with me. Like, I, I, it's nice that they, you were fooled for a little while. I was, I was fooled for a little while, yeah, for sure. It's a, uh, a, a very poetic script. You know, I, I didn't write it, of course, <laughs> but like, uh, I contributed to I mean, I, I kind of wrote the story of some what, you know. With sure. Like, uh, and uh, what was Diane, it? Uh, uh, Diane, Diane Reinhardt. Reinhardt. Yeah, who wrote most of that. And she, she worked with you again on uh, The Stranger in 94. And, uh, and uh, Hot Rod Hurst, she did with too. Great, uh, really the great, uh, another great uh, muse. If I had, you know, the few I've had in life, she was another one. Sharp, you know, really sharp lady. I really, there's a scene in here where uh, there's a, a live performance by the A Bones. Is uh, you want to talk about the A Bones a little bit? They were, they were, uh, you know, a band that was around. I, you know, I guess I started maybe seeing them in the in the '80s, later '80s. It was a record shop down here, Final Vinyl, and, and they had their records. So I talked to the guy. I said, "Well, you know these guys." And they turned out to be like a huge help to the thing, really. Uh, Norton Records, uh, they're, they're, they're the ones who put the thing on the map, really, because I didn't have like a kind of like a advertising acumen or like you know public relations. Uh, so you know they got it. They got their made a soundtrack album for it. You know, they played it on that WFMU local radio thing, and uh, they, they we had you know a nice big party for it, and uh, you know that it gave the thing legs really because it played around a little bit. It was like a, a nice like a high point. It was like a successful moment. Like the Orbitrons was was in good shape, but it was like at a different moment, and it was like a, it only, probably only played like a dozen times uh, in front of the public through the years. I mean, it ended up on videotape, and then it was on DVD, but uh, you know, it really didn't play around. But the mummy, mummy got around a bit. And nice. Billy, he, he he died. The, the singer of the band died. Yeah, uh, he's he's passed on four or five years ago. Yeah, something like mm -hmm. that. Three four years ago, something like that. And uh, he's actually yeah, a nice uh, person, but. He's a, he's a pretty interesting guy, Billy Miller. He actually, uh, there's a really great short documentary about Hassel Atkins called The Wild World of Hassel Atkins. He has a small oh, role yeah. in there, yeah, where he you see him for a sec talking about Hassel. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if he tells the story, but I remember always hearing the story from them. Uh, Hassel Atkins he used to carry around like, uh, like Vienna sausages with him. <laughs> <laughs> in case he got hungry, he would have like beef <laughs> Well, I wanted to say uh, there was a couple of things I really liked in uh, Teenage Mummy. That one, I think, kind of feels like uh, you start playing around with things uh, you don't see as much in the earlier work. Like, there's a really cool use of stop motion when it shows that sarcophagus opening. And there's also this, uh, there's also a really great, like, uh, point of view shot in that foggy graveyard. And it almost kind of looks like undercranked, like it's sped up a little bit. It's, uh... Yeah, we might have, you know, that might have been a thing where we undercranked. You know, maybe the 18 frames or something, and uh, and rolling through. It's probably probably because we had to, uh, because we're marching through there. I think holding like a single light, probably following, but that fog machine that was ever present. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Going through the cemetery was great. The Clinton Cemetery. I would make my trip. Yeah, there's a cemetery like close by. Yeah, I, I'll go visit it. Sure. I never bring like you know, maybe like in the old days they would bring a picnic out there to the cemetery. <laughs> I don't do that, but the, I like showing up. You know, checking out the monument. 
Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So anybody, if you want to see that uh, that short, it's on the Vimeo, along with all this other stuff we've talked about. Um, and as are your later films, we're just talking up to uh, 1992 here, but uh, you can see the other films like uh, The Be Real and Sweet Lorraine, several, several more. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been great talking with you. Hey, I appreciate you having me. Really, thank you very much. And uh, I hope we can do it again sometime. And, uh... Thank you again. Really, it's uh, you know it's great to talk about these things. <laughs> I tell you, it's great for, for me. Like you know, <laughs> feels great. You know, somebody's interested. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so a it's, cool. it's an it's an honor to have you on the show. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, the rest of your work here soon. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you for your time, Chris. So that was Chris Frieri, and once again, you can check out those films on Vimeo. I highly recommend them. Before I get rolling into my feature films here, we're going to have one more guest here to talk about what they've been seeing for Halloween, and that's going to be Antoine. So let's hear from Antoine. All right, so far my Halloween viewings, I've been doing the AMC theaters, their thrills and chills thing, which they show a new newish kind of older horror film they do two a week one on wednesday and one on friday for the month of october okay so the first one was done of the dead or four and the second one was trained of a son that was cool to see that one in theaters that was a really good experience seeing that one then after that was halloween 2018 then they did get out and us last week was the purge the first purge movie yesterday was it chapter one so i'm, I'm just gonna go on a guess and tomorrow's gonna be it chapter two and see outside of that i've been watching a lot of stuff for the scarecrow psychotronic challenge um my friend ed has been watching it with me and he's he hasn't seen a lot of this stuff so watching it with him getting his reaction to it is pretty cool he really enjoyed mad man and Ellie <laughs> from the Redneck Cinderella movie. He enjoyed those. Um, so it's been fun watching it with him. We also watched Hellraiser over the weekend, parts one and two, because those are his favorite films. He loves it. I guess it made an impact on him as a kid watching that. So I know Halloween Day, I'm going to do my traditional watch of night done and day of the dead and we're gonna throw in the movie that you sent me all my friends need killing because i think we're gonna save it for that one just to see what that's all about i have no idea what to expect it looks like it's gonna be wow i hope it is oh and i'm about to watch my scarecrow entry for tonight it's the martial arts pick and it is an unorthodox pick it is geki jukin sin hello Jukin Sentai Geki Ranger, the movie. And it is a martial arts extravaganza. It's some wild stuff. All right, so, yeah, that's what I've been watching. So thank you for letting me be a part of the show. Thank you, Antoine. And hopefully uh, we'll need to get him back on here. Uh, hopefully my friends need killing uh, didn't freak uh, him and Ed out too much. I don't know. Let's get him back on and find out. <laughs> so that's going to segue us now into the feature films that I watched for Halloween this year. And uh, we're going to try and move fast here. Lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, you know, the last couple of years we've I've, I've watched way too many movies, about 70, 80, and it's really hard to do these shows. Uh, when I started out doing this podcast, you know, the idea was that these episodes wouldn't be longer than an hour or six. And then I kind of stretched that and broke the rule and said 75 minutes. And then I stretched that and broke that rule many times. And, you know, we did this, like, two-hour Halloween show last year. And uh, it's actually gotten a really great response. A lot of people have watched it. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, now, this is a podcast. We do recommend you watch the video because we like to put a lot of funny images in there and things like that. So if you're just listening, you're only getting half the experience. Please watch the video. You know, we, we sneak in all these subversive images to brainwash people into buying our merch from the Facebook. So we're going to start off here. And the first film that I'm going to talk about uh, should be a little familiar to people who have listened to the show before. It's The Last Warning from 1928. Now this is a kind of a remake of Paulini's earlier film, The Cat and the Canary, which I discussed before. But this time the setting is a creepy old theater, which I kind of personally prefer. Uh, Michelle Suave's Stage Fright or Popcorn, you know, much later films uh, that kind of use the same premise. Part of the plot of this film, you know, basically uh, cops locking up a building 
uh, refusing exit to anybody so that they can narrow down the perpetrator of this crime. Uh, you see that again in other films, like a 1959 movie called Back to the Door. Now, this was Paulini's last film. Sadly, he died about eight months after its release from sepsis due to an untreated tooth infection. And uh, not a very familiar name, but it was shot by Hal Moore, who did uh, The Wild One, The Lineup, Underworld USA, Woman on the Run. Lots of great stuff under his belt there. You've got uh, actress Laura LaPlante, who is also in The Cat and the Canary. Uh, there's some leftover sets from Phantom of the Opera that they actually used on this film. Yeah, like I said, it is basically uh, a sort of remake of The Cat and the Canary, just in a different setting. But I actually, I think this film's just as good as that one. You've got a great opening montage with some really trippy superimpositions. Uh, basically, this actor gets killed on stage, and uh, years later... The producer decides to have the original cast of the production back to reprise the play, but suddenly these mysterious threats warn them not to do it. Is it the actor's ghost? You know, and this is a really playful movie. You've got inner titles that float across cobwebs. There's a really funny uh, visual gag with a bouncing bow tie when a guy gulps and his Adam's apple moves it around, you know. Of course it has a happy ending, but I recommend this film. Really good. Check out The Last Warning. Now we're going to talk about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1931. Director Ruben Mamoulian, this was his first and only horror film, and uh, the very first horror film to win an Academy Award in 1932 for Frederick March, uh, Best Actor. He tied with Wallace Beery for The Champ. The movie was also nominated for Carl Struss's Photography. Uh, he shot a lot of films that we've talked about on the show, but he also shot uh, Kurt Newman's She-Devil, Charlie Chaplin's Great Dictator and Limelight, Murnau's Sunrise, Sparrows, lots of stuff. And uh, Frederick March, you know, he, he got the award for this, but he worked with uh, John Frankenheimer a couple times, also in a lot of great movies like Merrily We Go to Hell, I Married a Witch. You got Miriam Hopkins in here. She was also in an Ernst Lubitsch film, uh, Trouble in Paradise, also in William Wyler's The Heiress. Halliwell Hobbs here, another Ernst Lubitsch movie, To Be or Not To Be, but also Gaslight, You Can't Take It With You, Dracula's Daughter. Edgar Norton here from Dracula's Daughter as well, but he was also in Son of Frankenstein, Only Yesterday from 1933 and Robert C. Odd Max, The Suspect. Rose Hobart, not a very familiar actress, but she was also in uh, Jacques Tourneur's Canyon Passage and Conflict with Humphrey Bogart. And one more actor I'll shout out here, Holmes Herbert. Probably seen him in uh, Foreign Correspondent, Sorry Wrong Number, Fritz Lang's Manhunt, Anne of the Indies, Tourneur Once Again, Don Siegel's The Verdict. Lots of recognizable faces here, and this is a classic film. A little fun fact about it, they actually offered director Irving Pichel, the lead role. Uh, the guy who directed Quicksand, and they won't believe me. That's pretty cool. And uh, there's lots of cool things in this movie. I liked the moving split screen that kind of looked like windshield wipers. And uh, there's, uh, this is a pre-code movie, so, you know, it's got, that, it's got that sensuality to it with that really kind of sexy, eerie, swinging leg superimposition. Uh, and, uh, but this, you know, this is a morality play here. Uh, you know, once you cross the barrier, you can never go back. And of course, uh, now that he's got the two sides, he can never be the same. But one question this movie left me with why do so many people keep calling him jekyll you know isn't it jekyll like i don't know who how, how's the right way to say that throughout the movie everyone's like oh yes dr jekyll and i was there i was very confused by that but this is a great movie of course watch it Next up, Dr. X from 1932 by Michael Curtiz, and we've mentioned this one on the show before. Curtiz, of course, famous Hollywood filmmaker, made Angels with Dirty Faces. Uh, now, this movie was shot with uh, this sort of neon green two-strip Technicolor uh, called The Process 3. The Technicolor print was thought lost for a long time, but they discovered it in Jack Warner's archive in 1975 after his death. And uh, they had two versions of this movie, one shot in black and white and one in the uh, two-strip Technicolor, The Process 3. Ray Renahan shot the color version. He also shot Terror in a Texas Town. Richard Towers did the black and white version. His only other film credits this 1932 comedy called You Said a Mouthful. The movie was edited by George Amy, he collaborated with the director several times on films like Captain Blood, Dodge City, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Not a lot of people know this was also a, a Broadway play, Dr. X, in 1931, and it's uh, still being produced uh, just as recently as October 27th at the Hudson Theater in New York this year. Now, this is an interesting little film, probably the only movie you'll ever see where a hand buzzer serves as a crucial plot point. You know, this jokester newspaper man gets involved in a story of cannibalism, mad science, and a potential mass murderer known as the Moon Killer. You know, this, re this reporter is pretty ingenious, even though he's really annoying. He even pretends to be a, a corpse in a morgue so he doesn't get to, you know, get discovered. 
so we can get the scoop. And, uh, there's a scene where Trick Cigars saves somebody from certain death. There's a strong emphasis on comedy in this movie, and I honestly didn't enjoy it as much as Mystery of the Wax Museum, but it's a really good movie, and you should watch it. Next up, we got Supernatural from 1933. Uh, once again, another great opening montage. You've got these news headlines talking about a serial strangler named Ruth Rogen, and we see her in court awaiting her execution. Uh, meanwhile, there's this scientist trying to do a mitogenic ray experiment uh, that he thinks will keep the evil spirit in the strangler from getting out into other people. Okay, so there's a drunk, nosy landlady and this phony spiritualist. And uh, this phony spiritualist kind of wants to uh, exploit this high society woman whose husband died, played by Carol Lombard. This convoluted situation where the ghost of the strangler has to get in Carol Lombard to get revenge on the phony spiritualist. And, uh, yeah, no, this is a fun little film. Uh, you've got Vivian Osborne in this movie, not a recognizable actress, but Mystery Science Theater fans will recognize her from I Accuse My Parents. And the doctor, uh, played by H.B. Warner, he's in tons of classic films like Sunset Boulevard, you know, and he worked with Frank Capra several times. Times. Check out Supernatural. That's a great film, even if it has kind of a happy bow tie ending. Next up, probably my favorite film of the 30s that I watched this month, The Man They Could Not Hang. I think this is a great movie. It features an early depiction of what would later actually turn real and become open heart surgery. But in the world of this film in 1939, of course, it's pretty radical. Basically, you've got Karloff as this guy named Dr. Savard who wants to scientifically induce death do this reanimation experiment. He's got like a consenting volunteer, but this worried nurse calls the cops. Ironically, the procedure's botched and her interruption sort of <laughs> leads to the death of this guy and Karloff goes on trial and tries to say, I only killed him so that I could give him life again. But you know, the jury's not really buying that. There's this heated ethical argument among them in a scene that kind of precedes 12 angry men. Uh, you know, so he gets the, the guilty verdict and Karloff just rails the, the courtroom. And luckily he gets executed, but his buddy, you know, his fellow scientist gets him out of the morgue, brings him back. Now you would think living well would be the best revenge, but Karloff says, fuck that, and, you know, <laughs> he decides to just kill the people that voted him guilty. Like, you know, I mean, couldn't you really just go and meet all these people at their house and be like, hey, look, see, I told you it works. But then it wouldn't be a good horror film. So, you know, you got people getting zapped by an electrocuted gate, and there's this eyeball-shaped speaker that, you know, he talks to the guests on. Great film. And we're going to go into another Karloff film that we've mentioned on the show before. That's Bedlam from 1946. Talked about Mark Robeson, the seventh victim, Isle of the Dead, in episode 11 of the show. Another underrated photographer here, you got Nicholas Musaraka, who shot this film. Uh, he worked with Jacques Tourneur on a few films, did Stranger on the Third Floor, Deadline at Dawn, The Locket, Blood on the Moon. And actor Jason Robards' father is actually in this movie. He plays an author named Oliver. This is a pretty great movie, set in London, 1761, during the ironically noted age of reason, quote unquote. And you know, we see this quote about the age of reason right before a guard steps on a ledge climber's hand and sends him, you know, flailing to his death. And uh, this is a pretty dark movie, but it's visually funny and very witty. Uh, there's a great shot where this guy, Lord Mortimer, steps out of a horse carriage. You know, we see the steps in extreme close-up. As soon as he steps off the carriage, the whole thing just shakes. It's kind of an apt visual metaphor for this guy's character. And uh, so you've got Boris Karloff as Sims, this evil sadist running the asylum, Bedlam. He's uh, kind of formed his own class system in this place. And uh, once again, this is probably the only movie you'll ever see where a talking parrot leads to this absurd parrot arrest situation, which leads to a war, which leads to someone being <laughs> falsely imprisoned for being uh, quote-unquote insane, this poor woman. Uh, all this over a parrot. A talking parrot. So, you know, this woman is vowed insane and locked up in there, and she has to learn to empathize with the uh, the inmates. This is a great film. I highly recommend it. Actually, uh, I would say that I like this one more than Seventh Victim and Isle of the Dead. Great movie. Next up, from 1946, a Chilean film called The Lady of Death. Now, this is directed by Carlos Hugo Christensen. We've talked about one of his films before on the show called If I Should Die Before I Wake, but he also made The Boy in the Wind, The Intruder from 79, Don't Ever Open That Door. And this is based partially on a Robert Louis Stevenson story. As far as I could guess, I'd say this is the first film to deal with the idea of a suicide club. And uh, basically, the story opens in this casino where a guy named Roberto loses at roulette, and this uh, creepy sort of guy named Clifford watches him. And uh, Roberto is going to commit 
suicide, but Clifford offers him this ominous invitation to a game. Turns out to be a suicide club, and he can't pay to get in, so he uses his mom's ring as an entry fee. And so, you know, Roberto, this guy basically, uh, he's kind of a fuck-up. Like, his family hates him, they're all bankers, they look down their nose at him, and uh, there was something in this movie that blew me away. About, like, 30 or so minutes in, there's, like, a reveal of sorts. The, the story is supposed to take place in London. And I was like, <laughs> like literally 30, 40 minutes, and I was like, wait a sec, this is supposed to be London? Because he's like, oh, let's go visit Scotland Yard. We're in London. I was like, I, what? I thought this, this is a Chilean movie. What's going on here? Uh, yeah, this is a pretty, it's kind of a dry film, but it's interesting. Not for everybody, but I really liked it. The Lady of Death. Check it out. Mentioned horror anthologies earlier. Anyone who's listened to the show knows that I'm a huge fan of horror anthologies. So we're going to start off with our first horror anthology feature film here. That's Three Cases of Murder from 1955. There's Three Cases of Murder. This is a UK-US co-production. This one actor, Alan Bedell, he has a, he acts in all three of the stories. You probably recognize this guy from The Sporting Life, uh, The Medusa Touch... The first story is uh, a little dry once again, but it's kind of witty. It's interesting. It's okay. You got this art gallery where this uh, painter's ghost is breaking the glass and luring employees and, you know, spectators into this haunted painting. Uh, the second story, kind of more of a crime suspense story than a horror thing. You know, basically these two guys go into business together, but one of them has blackouts. The other guy steals this girl, tries to make him think he killed her in a blackout. You know, the third story is pretty good. You got Orson Welles as the strict prosecutor who uh, harshly criticized one of his peers. You know, this guy named Owen starts having nightmares about being humiliated because he thinks it's revenge for humiliating that guy. You know, like he appears pantsless in court and everybody laughs at him. And then another dream, he's giving a speech and suddenly it becomes a whole sing-along in the entire room. One one interesting thing about this, about this story, Orson Welles' character is like a boozer. And the doc is like, when he has the doc see him, he's like, oh, you know what you need? Pills. Only in the 50s. If you want these daydreams to stop, uh, just take some of these pills with your booze. That'll be great. Uh, so he recommends him a therapist. <laughs> you know, this is not a great film in my opinion, but it's interesting. It's currently streaming on Criterion Channel, and you can see it. One of the directors, uh, David Eady, he also did that public information film, Play Safe, with the uh, the kids playing or getting electrified. And that's going to bring us into our next guest here, George Cook. Let's hear what George has been watching for Halloween 2021. Hey guys, my name is George Cook, and Strong Knots requested that I contribute to his podcast this month and kind of go over what I watched in October First one was Possession. This was a first time watch for me. Absolutely depressing and an intriguing mix of emotional and slimy horror. Recommended. Next up is Long Weekend. It's an exploitation animal run amok film. Absolutely worth checking out. Very, very depressing once again. Next up we have Mausoleum. It's a classic 80s cheese fest full of excellent effects, but kind of like Demon Warp. It just seems like a way to show off John Carl Buechler's uh, special effects more than it is interested in telling a story. Then we have Toby Hooper's Fun House. This was the first time watch for me. Uh, it has a lot of character and story focus when a lot of films of the time were just interested in being a straight up slasher. Definitely a weird one, but a lot of fun. Next is Devil Story. This is a French movie about a mutant or zombie roaming the French countryside while wearing an SS Nazi outfit. It is very dumb. It is very surreal, but it is a lot of fun. It definitely will keep you interested. Then we have Session 9, which is one of my favorite modern horror films. It's full of atmosphere and excellent performances all the way around. Next up was another first time watch for me. It's John Russo's Midnight. It's a little no budget backwoods killer hick film with satanic cult stuff mixed in. It's not Russo's best work, but it's still a lot of fun. After that, we have BHS 94 and decent little anthology films, but like the other VHS films, it is very hit or miss. There's Someone Inside Your House, a Netflix original that harkens back to the 90s teen slasher craze. It gets pretty gruesome and it's a lot of fun. A classic horror story, it's an Italian film that's more interested in blatantly ripping off other horror films instead of telling any sort of compelling story. After that was Halloween Kills. This is complete garbage. It is a cash grab. The script is terrible. The acting is shit. It is just horrible. Then we have Sun. It's a satanic antichrist film. Eh, it tries to set up some twists, but the ending is telegraphed very early on. Then was Blown from 2005, shot on video movie about a killer blow-up doll at a bachelor party. 
And if that sounds fun, you will really enjoy it. So, Actress Apocalypse was next. It's a mockumentary that is not worth anything. That was Dollar Store DVD. It is the worst film of the month. Avoid at all cost. And that's been my October. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, George. And that is going to move us into the 1960s here now with my next feature, Blood and Roses, directed by Roger Vadim. Uh, some really gorgeous photography in this movie by Claude Renoir, uh, who is actually the nephew of Jean Renoir, shot many of his films, uh, worked with Vadim on other projects as well, but he also shot uh, The Track with Mimsy Farmer, Attention, The Kids Are Watching with Alan Delon, The French Connection 2, which I think is pretty underrated. This is a really cool film uh, based on an 1872 novella called Carmilla, but the setting's updated to 1960 Italy, and they filmed in Hadrian's Villa. Uh, there's been some sort of controversy over these long-lost cut sequences uh, in this film, uh, including a piano and a sort of an amorphous eyeballed blob in the, in the nightmare scene. And there are multiple versions of this, uh, with the, the U.S. version has a different prologue and epilogue, uh, the Japanese version has different opening credits, and the French version has a ha, you know has re-edited the dream scene. And there's actually a great article by Tim Lucas on his video Watchdog blog from 2016 that kind of helps shed some light on this. You got the famous Mel Ferrer in this movie. He's actually in both Umberto Lenzi and Toby Hooper's Eaten Alive. Elsa Martinelli, who plays Georgia in this film, she was also in Orson Welles' The Trial. The Tenth Victim, Candy, Fulci's Perversion Story. Rene Jean Chauffard from Jean-Pierre Maki's Solo. The Stud, Thank Heaven for Small Favors. He was also in Patrick Duvall's Heraclitus the Obscure. Uh, might be a little too slow-paced and gothic for some people, but hey, fuck them. I thought it was wonderful. Uh, there's a great uh, cemetery fireworks celebration that blows up this mausoleum and awakens the spirit of this legendary vampire who resembles the main character. There's a really striking use of color and composition, camera movement in this movie. The nightmare scene's just wonderful, so I would love to see that footage restored if it isn't totally lost. I'd love to see the other scenes that are supposedly missing from there. And uh, unfortunately, there is sort of a, spoiler alert, crazy woman cop-out expository climax, but that really can't ruin a movie that's so poetic in so many other ways, I think. And it's, it's, it's a short movie, and it's really undervalued. Check out Blood and Roses. Next up, Paranoiac from 1963, directed by Freddie Francis, who we've talked about quite a lot on the show, a horror legend. This is one of those scheming family movies, you know, where there's like a tussle over inheritance and infighting within the family. You got the great Oliver Reed in this film, and there's a literal smash cut in this movie. He breaks a bunch of glasses with an empty brandy bottle. Uh, but the story is about this imposter, long-lost brother who gets concocted to sort of help old Ollie gain the family fortune. And uh, there's this <laughs> amazing scene where Ollie's raising hell in the bar, and he's like menacing people with darts. <laughs> Pretty great. You know, the killer is this, uh, wears this creepy oversized baby mask, and he attacks people with meat hooks. Yeah, this is like a fucked up family psychodrama. Kind of feels close to William Castle's work at the time. Uh, some recognizable faces here. You got Sheila Burrell from uh, Afraid of the Dark, 1991. Maurice Denham, who's in another film we'll talk about later. Uh, you've got Alexander Davian from Plague of the Zombies. And this movie was shot by Arthur Grant, who's no stranger to uh, horror films. He also shot The Devil Rides Out, Joseph Losey's The Damned, but he did other great stuff like Cash on Demand from 1961. Definitely check out Paranoiac. Fun film. Though not as fun as the next film, 1966, Sting of Death, directed by William Wild Bill Greffe. Now, this film's included in the Arrow video box set. Uh, he Came from the Swamp, which was released not too long ago, along with other films by the director like Death Curse of Tartu and The Hooked Generation. Uh, this is a film about a, a scuba-footed monster on a quote-unquote secluded island that's uh, obviously like a suburb. Uh, you got this professor with a fake black welt on his forehead, and uh, you get to see this old man in some really uncomfortable booty shorts later on. Uh, he's got this one-eyed assistant named Egon. All right, and lots of weird music in this movie. You got some music by Neil Sedaka, a song called Don't Be Stingy. Though I think, I think it was supposed to be Don't Be Stingy. You know, stingy. Uh, so basically some wasps uh, bully Egon and then form a conga line. They all pay for their transgressions. Uh, but uh, yeah, but there's a lot of weird things in this movie, like an extreme close-up on the monster's ass during a water chase scene for no reason. Yeah, this movie has a lot in common with the ghost of Drag Strip Hollow. It's just uh, it's fun hanging out. It's kind of this movie is very comfortable lounging around instead of trying to scare you. Although I'd say that the wasps and people in this movie are much worse than the juvenile delinquents of that film. I'd much rather hang out with the people in Ghost of Drag Strip Hollow. Absolutely hilarious. 
Check it out. Truly incredible movie, though. Let's talk about The Cremator from 1969 from Czechoslovakia, directed by Juraj Hare, who also made Morjana, uh, the 1978 version of Beauty and the Beast, Furat Vampire. This is a wonderful film, and I don't have anything too intelligent to say about it, so I'll just try and give you a few thoughts here. Basically a story about an unraveling cremator. He thinks he's helping the dead find purity in his delusions and he ends up assimilating into Nazism in 1930s Prague. And the film was originally intended to be shot in color but it's in black and white and uh, they filmed some of it in real crematoriums during the summertime and the stench of real death was present on set and I think that's somewhat apt because the film is similarly nauseating in an almost communicable way. Uh, like I was viscerally uncomfortable and wanted to get up and stop watching this movie in the first 30 minutes and I couldn't say why it just got under my skin I love films like that they use Hieronymus Bosch paintings in the film to parallel you know the hellish worldview that you're seeing here see the cremator see as many of these Czech new wave films as you can incredible stuff uh, and actually uh, Severin just released one of them witch hammer in their new folk horror box set so give that a look next up it's another anthology horror film here and we've got Panico Panic from 1972. This is a Mexican anthology from director Julian Soler. He also made Castle of the Monsters. He has over 60 other credits. Kind of confusing the information on this movie. IMDb has it listed as 1966, despite the fact that their release date on the website says June 15th, 1972. And then there's other websites like Mubi that say the film came out in 1970. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where you see a gravestone and it says 1970, so I think it's fair to say it's not from 1966. Uh, pretty obscure little movie. Has plenty of flaws, but mostly a strong opening and concluding story. You know, all these stories will be familiar to horror acolytes. There's no bookends. Uh, there's a cool animated backdrop behind the opening credits. First story, you know, big empty house with a sad woman who hears a crying baby that isn't there. Uh, she clutches a child's doll. This older woman, who might be a witch, appears and chases her through the woods. This story is told really expressively through images and strong camera work, and it's mostly dialogue-free. And then they totally blow it at the end with this obvious twist that's totally redundant because it's clear from the beginning where the story's going. I mean, you know what's going on in the first 30 seconds with the main character. Total cop-out cliche. But the lead actress here, uh, Anna Martin, she was also in this Robert Taylor western, Return of the Gunfighter, a uh, car exploitation film called Mad Drivers. Then you've got Ophelia Guimain, who was also in uh, Buñuel's Nazarin, The Exterminating Angel. Uh, she was in The Scapular, The Perverse Doll from 1969. Second story here is called Solitude. It's about these two guys in the jungle, you know, putting the finishing touches on a grave for a plague victim. They ride home on a canoe, see visions of the same woman both alive and dead. And her identity is later revealed as the captain's wife, who the other man was having an affair with. They get in a fight. He kills the captain, but the captain won't stay dead. This is the weakest of the three stories. Uh, it feels a lot longer than it should be compared to the first story's clean-cut editing, you know? Now, the actor who plays the older captain guy who gets killed, Joaquin Cordero, he was also in The Book of Stone from 1969, and he worked with Buñuel once again on The River and Death and A Woman Without Love. Third story here, I mean, there's another film later on here that has a very similar story to this. Uh, scientist creates this narcotic, his cat, knocks it over, I don't know why he has a cat in his lab, uh, licks it up, and it kind of simulates artificial death. The thing is, it simulates it way too well. And this doctor tries it on himself, but makes the crucial mistake of not leaving a note behind explaining his situation. So everyone just assumes he's dead. Uh, very similar to that Tales from the Crypt episode with Bo Bridges. It's a familiar story, but there's a really funny punchline on it. You got an actor here, Jose Galvez, who plays Abel. He was also in the uh, Roberto Gavaldon film Macario. Uh, also this weird Rene Cardona film, The Incredible Professor Zovek. Not a great movie, but worth seeing. It's always cool to see... Uh, anthology films from other countries and how they tell kind of stories that might or might not be familiar to an American audience. Next up, Shanks from 1974. Talked about William Castle several times on the show. This was his final film as director. Uh, the music was composed by Alex North, who did uh, Streetcar Named Desire and Spartacus, and he actually rearranged some of his rejected score for 2001 A Space Odyssey for this film. And strangely enough, the score was nominated for an Oscar. Yes, this Marcel Marceau horror comedy was nominated for an Academy Award for the score. And uh, Joseph H. Birak shot this film. He also shot Cry Danger, The Twonky, three of Sam Fuller's films, several Robert Aldridge films, Blazing Saddles. Basically, it focuses on the deaf-mute puppeteer, Marcel Marceau, and he's got a drunk brother-in-law, badgering sister, uh, and he starts seeing this mystery doctor doing frog experiments. The brother-in-law is played by uh, Philippe Clay from Bell Book and Candy. 
Randall. The sister is uh, Scylla Chelton from Peppermint Soda. And uh, he's got this child friend, Celia, played by Cindy Eilbacher from Bad Ronald and uh, Slumber Party Massacre 2. And she doesn't really suspect anything about him until he puts on a puppet show for her birthday with the corpses. But she hasn't freaked out by it for too long. She kind of rolls with it and they have a birthday party. This biker gang has an accident by the house and breaks into the house. You know, things go into motion. Now, the bikers are really recognizable. One of them is Don Kalfa. Uh, one of the bikers is Biff Menard. You got Larry Bishop, Phil Adams, and uh, the cop in here, Reed Morgan. Interesting film. Pretty interesting way for William Gessel to end his career. Strange movie, for sure. The next film, Holy Mackerel. You're not prepared for this. So Antoine mentioned earlier that I uh, gave him a copy of this film to see, and that's My Friends Need Killing from 1976, directed by Paul Leder, the man who made Sketches of a Strangler and I Dismember Mama. Man, this is a grueling, grueling movie. Highly recommended. Absolutely not for everybody. Only for those with strong stomachs. Really an anti-war film. Main character is Gene, played by Paul Malavy from Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, CC and Company, several other films. Uh, a lot of the other actors in this film worked with the director on a movie he did called Vultures, but Gene is basically a shell-shocked Vietnam vet who decides to uh, pop off his fellow platoon members in order to atone for the atrocities they committed overseas. And uh, there's a great part where he's mailing letters to them, and that's how they introduce all the other characters. Um, it's kind of strange, this movie, because it's really disturbing. And effective, but there's this occasionally ill-fitting, like, deodorant commercial sounding music, and it just makes the tonal shifts all the more effective, I think. You know, because one minute, that's kind of sounds like a 70s TV movie, and the next second, you're just like, holy shit, what the, what's going on? Uh, the, <laughs> one funny thing, there's not a lot of uh, comedy in this movie, but there's some unintentional comedy, because the guy who plays the shrink uh, is very awkward with his hands. Uh, but, you know, they drive home the, the Shakespearean aspects of this revenge story with King Lear and Macbeth quotes, and there's a really, really tragic performance scene right before this one character's murder and it's just you would not believe how emotional and full of pathos the scene is uh i'm shocked this movie doesn't have a blu-ray it's really underrated really uncompromising and it has a surprisingly redemptive ending which is a real gamble because the lead character seems pretty irredeemable there's a rape scene in the film absolutely crazy uh, and there's quick flashes of real war footage sprinkled throughout the film to kind of tread the exploitation barrier, but undeniably, it's effective. One of the best films I've seen this year. My friends need killing. Check that out. Hard to find. Next up, from Canada, it's 1977's Rituals, and this is streaming on Shudder at the moment. Watch this movie. Incredible movie. One of the best horror films of the 70s, just like the last film I talked about. Uh, this was shot in the Ontario forest, and there had recently been some fires there, so that kind of adds to the atmosphere. Uh, director Peter Carter also made The Intruder Within, High Ballin' with Peter Fonda. The movie was shot in 76, but not released till 78, kind of unceremoniously re-released later as The Creeper. It kind of takes cues from the Don't Go Down to Dixie film, that Henry Crinkle talked about in our exploitation episode, but it mostly tells a fish-out-of-water story that turns into a stalk-and-slash survival drama. And there's a brilliant, ironic touch of focusing on doctors stranded in the woods. I mean, after all, their amazing knowledge of the human body and recovery can't save them. And so it becomes this tense, like, sort of drama between bickering men, and, you know, they, it's, like, uh, it's like the classic Romero situation, like Night of the Living Dead, where people's uh, failure to communicate ultimately ends up being the death of them. Now, of course, you've got Hal Holbrook in this film. We'll talk about him some more later. Also, Lawrence Dane from Happy Birthday to Me, Robin Gamble from The Haunting of Julia, Ken James from Blood and Guts, Gary Reinecke from Sunday in the Country, uh, you got Murray Westgate as the plane pilot. He was in Heavenly Bodies, Jack Creed from Videodrome. There's some gorgeous location photography here. Rene Verzier shot this film. He also shot The Picks, The Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane, uh, Cronenberg's Rabid. The history of this movie, it's always been kind of murky and hard to see. I actually think, in a way, the damaged print, no matter what the cause is, kind of adds to the effectiveness of this as a movie. You know, the day scenes are kind of washed down, yet there's these, like, sunspots that still kind of occasionally blind the frame. It makes the dangers of broad daylight all too real, you know, because when you can see everything thing around you you don't expect this fear but the sun can get in your eyes anything can grab you anything can happen and it's the same situation with the night scenes you know you almost have to squint to see what's going on occasionally despite the high contrast and it really exploits the reality of that fear in the woods that i think so many movies take for granted so yeah highly suspenseful movie occasionally some great gore though it's not really that kind of film and uh some people might find the reveal of the killer pretty underwhelming it shares similarities with other stuff like don't go in the woods and just before dawn but i think it works here better 
than in those films because it drives home the irony of these intelligent men who fall so easily into reprehension and paranoia and accusations when the real problem is something totally alien and unknown to them. And it ends with an amazing shot. There's a great final shot in this movie. Watch Rituals, currently on Shudder. Also on Shudder, an even better film from 1978, The Shout, directed by the underrated Jerzy Skolomowski, most famous for Deep End and Essential Killing, but he also made Moonlighting with Jeremy Irons, The Departure, Walkover, tons of great stuff. Uh, you got John Hurt, Alan Bates, really, really clever use of sound design to reflect John Hurt's character's work. Uh, they recorded this movie in Dolby Stereo with 40 different music tracks. And uh, they originally offered the project to Nicholas Roque, but he turned it down. And, uh, you know, they kind of play off real Aborigine legends, like uh, Bone Pointing. Basically, Alan Bates is a stranger who intrudes on John Hurt and starts staying in his house and tells him about how he studied this death shout that took him like 18 years to learn and how he can kill a man just by shouting. And if, you know, that plot might not sound great to you, but believe me, this is one of the best films ever made. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, there's a Francis Bacon painting. For Shadows, a really disturbing later shot with Susanna York. And I won't say anything else about this movie except this. Watch it. Amazing movie. One of the best films I've ever seen. Next up, also great, Shalkin the Painter from 1979. This was originally broadcasted as part of the BBC program Omnibus, who also produced Whistle and I'll Come to You, both of which are often debatedly categorized as ghost stories for Christmas. Uh, supposedly Peter Cushing was offered the role of the narrator, but found the story distasteful. Uh, and the director had worked in TV since, you know, like 1968. It's adopted from uh, Joseph Thomas Sheridan Le Fanu's story, based on the real painter Gottfried Schalken. And in this fictional story, Schalken is in love with a woman named Rose. He's studying under uh, Garrett Dow. And, but this pale, ghastly-looking old suitor named Vanderhausen buys Rose's marriage from the master. She doesn't want to go. Schalken's kind of a selfish guy and wants to continue his work and says, oh, I'll just buy back the marriage later. Well, years pass. Schalken's now this acclaimed painter. The woman suddenly returns on her own after years without having been heard from. She's in a state of fright and she requests wine. You know, she's totally like off the hinges, so they put her to bed. And the old man visits once again, but this time he looks a lot younger. And she flees out the window in terror, but she's totally unseen. She's vanished. And Dow dies, and Shalkin just paints these ghostly limbs and unnameable apparitions into his paintings as a way of expressing this torment, working out his demons. Great stuff. You got John Justin, who plays Vanderhausen. He was also in Ken Russell's Savage Messiah, Listomania. Uh, Anthony Sharp, who was in a couple of Kubrick's films. Also House of Mortal Sin, I'll Never Forget What's-His-Name. Uh, Roy Evans from The Fearless Vampire Killers, Alan Clark's Ball. This is just a well-shot, exquisitely paced, classic piece of British television, you know, from probably the best time in their history. Uh, the 60s through the 80s, there was just some incredible stuff on British television. Highly recommended. Next up, a rewatch of a film that's pretty famous. I don't think I need to say too much about this one. That's David Cronenberg's The Brood from 1979. I've seen this a few times before. It gets better as I get older. And uh, I won't say too much about it. I think it's a pretty popular movie. One fun fact about the movie, we got Oliver Reed once again. Ollie! Supposedly he was arrested during the shoot of this movie because he took a bet that he couldn't walk naked in the freezing cold from one bar to another. And by God, he did it. He did it, man. Gotta love old Ollie. So The Brood, great film. And with that being said, we're going to hop now into our next guest spot, and that's Kevin Howell. Hello, my name is Kevin Howell. I'm a VHS collector and fan of horror, action, and generally weird movies. Thanks to Strong Knots, I've been invited to talk about a few films that I love and think are underappreciated. The first movie I'd like to talk about is Kiss the Girls Goodbye from 1997, written and directed by Lee Karam. The movie was made on a budget of only $14,000 and had a mostly unknown cast. The movie is about Carl, a piano teacher with psychopathic tendencies who kidnaps a woman after pretending to help her with her car problems. He then locks her into a secret room of his house where he begins injecting her with heroin and torturing her. Carl is a legitimately creepy villain who's scarred by his upbringing from his overbearing mother. He is socially awkward and turns to drugs and kidnapping women to fill the holes in his psyche. Frankie Day, who plays Carl, has a face and physique that make Carl an imposing, psychotic character. He has a smoldering intensity and some really raw performances. The story takes some interesting turns, especially in the final act. Kiss the Girls Goodbye is a gem of a low-budget horror movie, and it is available on VHS and DVD. The next movie I'd like to talk about is Noroi the Curse from 2005, directed by Koji Shiraishi. Noroi is a Japanese found-footage horror movie that follows the character of Masafumi Kobayashi, 
a paranormal researcher who documents supernatural activity. The movie is mostly presented as a documentary that Kobayashi made while investigating a series of connected psychic and demonic occurrences. It is filmed on a handheld camera and feels very believable as an actual low-budget documentary, which adds a lot to the eerie mood of the film. The movie takes its time to establish its mythology and rituals, but doesn't over-explain itself. These details are woven into the events of the movie in a way that makes you believe that there is always more going on than you can know at first glance. Noroi has great story, excellent atmosphere, and is one of the better found footage horror movies I have seen. Unfortunately, there's no physical release in the United States for Noroi, but it is available for streaming on Shudder. The last movie I'd like to talk about is Ankle Biters from 2002, written and directed by and starring Adam Minerovich. Ankle Biters is a Z-tier blade ripoff with a bizarre twist. The vampires are all little people, hence the movie's tagline, Don't Look Down. Minerovich plays Drexel Venice, a half-human, half-vampire vampire hunter. In this world, vampires are all little people that seek to get a sword with the blood of the last tall vampire in it that they can use to convert tall people into vampires again. It takes itself fairly seriously despite this ridiculous premise, which is part of what makes the movie so enjoyable for me. Anklebiters has gloriously bad acting, stunt work, and effects. Minerovich is not believable as a badass at all, but his attempt is often amazing as he tries to make himself sound cool by faking a gravelly voice the whole time. There's also a uniquely terrible theme song that just repeats the lyrics, three feet tall, two inch fangs, over some generic metal riffs. It's definitely one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It fails in almost every conceivable way a movie can fail, and it's definitely not going to be something that everybody can enjoy. It seems like it was shot using a consumer-grade digital camera and mic'd with the onboard microphone, so there's some very poorly lit shots and some genuinely bad sound. It drags pretty bad in the middle, but it's a good movie to throw on with friends who can appreciate truly Z-tier cinema. Ankle Biters is available on VHS and DVD, but the full movie is also available for free on YouTube. Once again, my name is Kevin Howell, and you can find me on my YouTube channel, Solar City Video, where I upload VHS rips and my own video edits. Thanks for listening. All right, so with that being said, we're going to move now into the 1980s, and the first film we're going to talk about is an Australian flick called Nightmares, also known as Stage Fright. And yes, both of those titles are also the titles of several other movies. So you uh, wouldn't be blamed for not knowing uh, which movie is that now? Kind of a bad rep this movie has. Uh, it's not very well regarded, but frankly, I thought the steady cam work in it was really good, uh, even if you can see the photographer's shadow in that point of view montage at the beginning. Uh, tons of really pretty lens flares, especially in the audition scene. Basically, this little girl causes a car accident in anger over uh, some guy putting the moves on her mom. And she grows up to be a sexually repressed adult, and she's like doing theater work, acting on stage. There's this over-the-top director uh, who refers to buttholes as freckles. He uses this as an insult against his actors. He's like, oh, you bloody freckle. Well, I mean, they're Australian, so, oh, you freckle. You know, uh, whistling is blamed for someone's death. Uh, there's a great line where the director yells at someone. He says, change that shirt. Why? Because it's green. There's a really cool, unsteady, handheld tracking shot uh, during this lover's argument by the lake. Uh, yeah, lots of funny stuff in here. There's a pretty gnarly shard in the next scene, and this is uh, one of those semi-slashers that takes place entirely in an auditorium for the performance, but but years before Michelle Suave's similarly named film, Stage Fright, Aquarius. This is a slight movie, admittedly, but I think it's really well made, even if it's occasionally clumsy. Not half as bad as his reputation. And, you know, John D. Lamont, the director, he also made this exploitation film, Felicity, from 1978, and this fake-out Mondo flick called Australia After Dark from 75. The lead actress Jenny Newman. She was also in Hell Night with Linda Blair, My Favorite Year with Peter O'Toole. Uh, Gary Sweet, an actor in this movie who also worked with Rolf Tahir on several films like Alexandra's Project, The Tracker, Charlie's Country, and Max Phipps here you'll probably recognize from The Road Warrior, uh, The Cars That Ate Paris, Dark Age, The Return of Captain Invincible. Pretty fun movie. I don't know. I enjoyed it. Not, not many people seem to, but I liked it. And another somewhat controversial movie here that people seem to hate, but I had a lot of fun with, that's Girls' Night Out from 1982, uh, filmed in East Orange, New Jersey, and some of New York. Now, you know, there's a famous trailer with this woman in bed made for this movie, and she's talking about the film. It's like this <laughs> erotic situation where she's like, oh, I just love to be scared. Well, that woman's not in the movie. 
Uh, the movie was shelved for quite a while, had the alternate title The Scaremaker. We mentioned Hal Holbrook earlier with Rituals, and he's in this film as well as his son David. Uh, you've got a really underrated actress here, Ritanya Alda, who is in quite a few of De Palma's films from the 70s. She also worked with Paul Mazursky and Jerry Schatzberg a couple times. She was in To Find Man, Christmas Evil, and you got a couple other horror movie actors here who pretty much just did a couple horror movies and disappeared, like Lauren Marie Taylor, who was Vicky in Friday the 13th Part 2, Cara Glenn, who was in The Burning, recognizable actor here, kind of a character actor, Richard Bright, who played Al Neary in the Godfather movies. Uh, he was in Rancho Deluxe, worked on a couple Peckinpah movies. And this is one of those whodunit slasher flicks. You know, you got a womanizing bear mascot. And this is a pretty generally gropey movie. Uh, I'm not going to justify it by saying it was the 80s, so it's a really leering, kind of gross movie. A lot of people, I'm sure, don't like it for that. But the whole tone of the movie is just so over-the-top and ridiculous. Like, this film feels fueled by drug use, uh, or abuse, as it were. Uh, you know, you got these grave diggers killed with a shovel in a completely bloodless death scene. The outfits in this movie are just on point. You got fringe jackets and poodle skirts. Uh, the first half of the movie is more gossipy than anything. It almost plays more like a sex comedy than a horror film for the for the the vast chunk of it at the beginning and at one point the bear suit killer gets some knife fingers in their in their costume and I, <laughs> you know you can't resist a good teddy krueger joke when you see that but uh, there's some goofy interludes with this dj and killers trolling him but the weird thing about this movie i think part of the reason it hasn't been reissued on blu-ray they must they can't afford the music licensing i'm guessing because there's like six songs in the movie that they play over and over again and one of them is do you believe in magic so <laughs> the, the wild tone of this movie makes it kind of unpredictable uh the killer revelation is completely absurd but totally hilarious so I don't know. Not for everybody. If you want to see something stupid and fun, I think Girls' Night Out hits the ticket. It's stupid. It's fun. Watch it. Next up from 1982, a really underrated French film called Light Tan. Now, I talked about Jean-Pierre Maki a little bit earlier, uh, the director of Solo, Thank Heaven for Small Favors. Well, he actually plays the lead in this film and directed it. Plays the husband, Jock. The basic story, him and his wife, Nora, are in the town of Light Tan for this bizarre festival of the dead. And uh, strange things start happening, and they decide to get the hell out of there but they can't. Now, the story kind of languorously creates a loose narrative. Kind of, it's basically kind of comes across as a considerably less gory, more carnivalesque Fulci film, complete with Italian-sounding music. The music's by Nino Ferrer. He also acts in the film as Dr. Steve Julian. And I don't know, for me personally, I thought it had the kind of beguiling atmospheric intensity of something like a Zulowski film or Wojciech Haas, you know, the Hourglass Sanatorium. It kind of has that same feeling for me. You got this blue energy spirit life form that you see through mad animation that floats into bodies and the town is shrouded in fog where these accidental deaths turn into overt killings and there's droves of just animated townsfolk and marching band suits and baby masks, monk outfits, they're raving in the streets, swinging axes, and really wonderful tracking shot with a jeep barging through the streets full of mad men, you know, while they're trying to escape the chaos. Uh, one thing I like about this movie, things are constantly out of place. That kind of contributes to the spookiness of the story. Like, they, they visit a hospital, and there's cages full of dogs in the hospital. And yeah, Jean-Pierre Maki, he made a lot of uh, interesting cult films, like this weirdo satire thriller called The Unsewing Machine about a gun-toting doctor who goes on a killing spree to convince the city to build a blind children's hospital. Uh, lots of weird stuff he's made, like uh, Kill the Ref and other things like that. He also produced and co-edited the film, and it was shot by Edmund Richmond, who uh, worked with Buñuel on uh, several films. Uh, he also worked with Orson Welles on Chimes at Midnight in the Trial, shot and Hope to Die, and uh, yeah, this is a really great movie. I think it's underrated. Uh, the look of the old Erie town, that's a real commune called Anane. And it's a city that's retained much of its historical architecture. And so the film just really does feel like this lived-in nightmare that seems very familiar to you, despite the, uh, the mystery of it all. Very enigmatic. I love this movie. Now we're talking about crazy movies here. You want to hear about something really crazy. Devil Fetus, 1983. From where? Hong Kong, of course. Director who made this movie only really has about six to seven films, from what I could find uh, from available information. They're mostly like gangster crime dramas. But uh, the director was the director of photography on Ringo Lamb's Full Contact uh, and Undeclared War. He also uh, shot this really stunt-crazy crime movie called Iron Angels that Teresa Wu-San made. He also shot uh, Choi Hark's We're Going to Eat You. 
You might recognize some of the actors here, like Eddie Chen, who was in another Category 3 rape revenge flick, The Beasts, Lao Dan, who was in The Devil's Mirror, Hex After Hex. You've got uh, Ouyang Shafei from Seating of a Ghost, Calamity of Snakes, Lady with a Sword. This movie is just incredibly gross. If you enjoy films like The Boxer's Omen, you'll want to see this. Uh, the only real content warning I can provide, there is a scene of real animal murder, which sadly I guess you expect from these crazy-ass Category 3 and, you know, cannibal movies and everything. But yeah, if you enjoy stuff like Mystics in Bali, you'll probably like this film. Uh, there's a phallic magic vase with a moving creature on it that uh, immediately possesses this woman for monster sex. And her boyfriend walks in on this, breaks the vase in envy, becomes a melty-faced zombie with maggots under his skin, and jumps out the window to his death. This is like the first three minutes of the film, I think. Like the first ten minutes for sure. Uh, some great stop motion in here. Um, crazy scene where this American couple, who's hilariously dubbed in Cantonese, gets attacked by a dog and it sticks its head up the lady's dress. It's a really weird fucking movie. Uh, lots of crazy effects. You got a car splitting in half. There's a bizarre drag masturbation possession scene with a foaming coke smash cut climax. Eagle blood exorcism. You got a shrinking room with a gnarly head squish. Yeah, devil fetus. Highly recommended. Next up, pretty popular film that I won't say too much about, 1983, it's Cronenberg once again, The Dead Zone. Now I will bring this up because this was my first uncut viewing of the film. I'd seen it on cable TV before, but I never actually sat down and watched the movie uncut in the right aspect ratio without commercial breaks. Uh, and uh, this is a great movie, I think pretty underrated actually for Cronenberg. Oliver Reed's assistant in The Brood, Nicholas Campbell, he plays the murderous cop here, and he was also in Fast Company, Naked Lunch. Uh, this guy has a genuine intensity. These really piercing eyes. I'm surprised he didn't get sort of bigger casting roles. He was also in uh, William Friedkin's Rampage, Knights of the City, and uh, the movie almost kind of looks like it's going to take an extremist view towards the end, but ultimately it's a morality tale that I think shows the consequences of extremism and how, you know, they ask the question, if you could go back and kill Hitler, would you? Well, the question is maybe do you not have to kill him, maybe you just have to stop him. And so it kind of deals with that, I think, and it's a really great movie. Supposedly Stephen King wanted Bill Murray to play the lead role in this, which is totally bizarre. Ed Glosser, Trivial Psychic. Yeah, The Dead Zone, great movie. Next up, little Indonesian film from 1986 called Satan's Bed. The man who made, once again, Mystics in Bali, but also Lady Terminator, Dangerous Seductress. Uh, this is a total nightmare on Elm Street cash grab, but it is loopy fun, okay? Starts off with a silent night sing-along on Christmas that ends in a shotgun spree, so you know right away this is gonna be fun. Uh, you know, you got a dream spirit that escapes TV and comes into the real world. You got characters saying things to each other like, be supportive, bitch. You know, the glove in the bathtub bit with a really badly cut drowning attempt. Someone wears an oversized t-shirt that says, this is my sexy shirt. There's a great line of dialogue that's probably just poor subtitle translation, but a couple characters are going to go upstairs and have sex, and their friend says, don't do the nasty thing. Uh, you know, you got creepy dolls, self-de-thumbing, obvious wire work. There's a bench on the back of a police truck, some really aggressive subtitles, uh, a ghost lady that says, Rudy, come here! And not to mention the highlight of this movie, an exorcist shaman. A severed head bites this exorcist shaman's wiener. But, uh, yeah, insane fucking movie. Uh, you know, you got flying skeletons, lasers, and exploding houses, so watch, watch it. it. And that brings us into our next guest spot here. That's going to be Cass Doomcock talking about a Ray Bradbury adaptation called The Velt. Hello, my name's Cass. Thank you for asking me to do this. I live to talk anything horror. All right, so let me tell you about The Vilt. It's a Russian horror science fiction dystopian as hell film by a director whose name I will not try to pronounce it. I'm just going to butcher it. Uh, it came out in 1987. It's an adaptation of a few Ray Bradbury short stories. Um, you actually put this on my radar and it grabbed my attention because The Velt is a pretty solid short story by Ray Bradbury and it also fit for my Beasts of Burden prompt for the Scarecrow video Psychotronic Challenge. I went completely blind into this movie and once it started I noticed immediately that it wasn't only going to be covering the short story The Velt. Um, so from there I was expecting anthologies but it kind of just ended up being five of Bradbury short stories hodgepodge together and turned into a very weird and gloomy story all its own. 
It mainly covered pieces from the Velt and the Martian chapter from the Martian Chronicles with like little nods to the dragon, Marionettes Incorporated, Dandelion Wine, and the Pedestrian. I enjoyed this quite a bit. I think it did help that I was familiar with the stories and I was able to put in a little bit of context that I don't know if you would have if you hadn't read it. Anyway, like this movie is weird, dystopian. If you're into that, check it out. Um, If you like Ray Bradbury, check it out. Uh, If you watch it and you dig it and you haven't read the stories, read some of his stories. They're pretty good. And he's like, for all of these coming out in the 50s, he kind of calls a lot of shit out. That's a little, a little funny (laughs) to, to read. But yeah, that's, that is the Velt. I don't want to give too much away, but it's definitely, it's worth your time. All right. Thank you, Cass. And so a movie that's not worth your time, unfortunately, would be Frenchman's Farm from 1987. But it does have its merits. One of the problems with this movie, there's too much wall-to-wall dialogue. Uh, The exposition kind of overwhelms the film and removes any trace of fun you could have with the story. And, you know, there is some really professional camera work in it, but that just cannot gloss over a boring script that somehow wastes the idea of time travel. It feels underdeveloped, despite the fact that the screenplay drags. However, that being said, there's a really great creepy swimming sequence, main highlight of the movie, and it ha- it ends in a legitimately great jump scare. A lot of people write off jump scares, but you know, uh, it's all in how you use it. And I-, I thought there was a great jump scare. Well, another problem with this movie, the main characters are totally uninteresting. Let's be honest, they don't have enough characterization. It's literally, here's the boyfriend, he's in a band. Here's the girlfriend, she's off to uni. And that's it. And the cover is completely misleading, although I love the fact that the VHS tape, the box art, says, like, also currently in theatrical release. So, next up, The Witch's Sabbath from 1988, a little Italian film made in Tuscany, directed by Marco Blocchio, who made Fists in the Pocket, Slap the Monster on page one. Beatrice Dow plays a witch named Madalena, a witch from the 1600s who's alive in the 1980s. In the opening shot, you see her standing in the foreground as these trees behind her suddenly just burst into flames. And right away, you know, this is going to be a dramatic, kind of artfully measured film, so it might not hit a lot of people the same way. Some people might find it pretentious or boring and pointless. I don't know, I really liked it. Unpredictably kind of in favor of surrealism, blending the line between hallucination and reality, and it very fluidly breaks between what's really happening, what he's seeing, whether it's the past or present, and, you know, the psychiatrist is falling out with his wife as the witch takes over. There's a heavy use of dancing, choreography in this movie. It's very visually expressive through movement and composition. I knew I was going to love this movie from the first, like, ten minutes. There's a shot where Beatrice Dow kind of circles the frame laughing at the psychiatrist, and the shot's just totally amazing and enchanting. I knew right away I was going to love this movie. And this movie's really interesting to me because it is both a really highly erotic horror film and a complex commentary on those types of films with the quote-unquote antagonist witch character in full control of her own sexuality and longing but there's like a panel of desperate brutish male characters like the physicians at her uh, modern trial in the 80s a really interesting film check it out i like the witch's sabbath a lot now a film i didn't like so much that's freak show from 1989 Oof. this is an anthology horror film not to be confused with another later anthology horror film called freak show from 1995 this movie is really subpar still kind of fun i'm a sucker for these movies basically the book ends this movie starts off with a movie theater massacre and a murderer named fidge not every day you see a murderer named fidge but there's this sassy diabolical news anchor who gets invited into a freak show museum to use the telephone instead she gets treated to a laser light room like a pink floyd concert with this big brain boy in a jar the owner of the freak show tells her these stories first story junkyard poodle versus junkie transient it's got some action music slap bass that saves the day uh they got this extreme close-up of a dog with a bag of heroin in its mouth which is fucking hilarious but the more you see it it's less hilarious story two spooky delivery story starts off with a knife fight in a pizza place you know these things happen uh, this guy from the stores double dared to deliver za to a supposedly haunted house but the driver finds babes instead of ghosts and then the story turns into a warrant video brah sick really shitty twist in this story worst story in the movie uh next story there's a keyed up mortician and his window entering assistant who want to reanimate corpses but the serum makes people think they're dead hey wait that sounds familiar exact same story as the one i talked about earlier and Panico, 72 film. Last story, probably the highlight of the movie. A guy dies during a golf game. His gold digger wife 
shows up at the funeral where there's a tee off at the tombstone. And I would say that this story is kind of representative of, of the film as a whole. It's all lingerie and no nudity, okay? But it does have a grave digger named Funk, so that's pretty cool. Uh, there, there's a dirt theft scheme that backfires and zombies and golf carts crash a party. There you go. Next up, Ghost House 3, The House of Lost Souls from 1989 by Umberto Lindsay. Kind of a confusing history with the Ghost House films. Basically, Evil Dead 1 and 2 were released in Italy as La Casa 1 and 2. Uh, then Lindsay's Ghost House from 1988 came out, and that was considered La Casa 3. Then there's a film called Witchcraft with David Hasselhoff, which is considered Ghost House 2 and La Casa 4. And then Claudio Fregazzo's Beyond Darkness is Ghost House 4, and House 2 and 3 are La Casa 6 and 7. But this film's Ghost House 3, even though it's part of the Doomed Houses series, which it would be part 4 of, what the fuck is going on? Anyway, this film, probably a lot of people will write it off, but it's just a good old-fashioned, goofy, haunted house story, so I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm a big fan of Umberto Lenzi. Story focuses on this hesitant medium who has uh, visions of a Hare Krishna chopping up a Buddha statue's head, blood spurting out, you know. There's a TV reporter who wants to interview these uh, traveling geology students, because that's something people want to see on TV, I guess. And they come across this closed road, spend the night at a place called the Hermit Motel, which has a very similar background to the Overlook. There's a really shocking first death in this movie, Death by Dryer. Uh, even knowing that, watch the movie, I believe this, this first death in this movie is shocking, really caught me off guard. There's a scene where it seems like there's kind of a goreless kill cop-out, but it leads to a reveal about the groundskeeper's decapitation obsession, although I would admit the later chainsaw kills, tad disappointing. Uh, there's a great jump scare kill that comes out of nowhere. The ending is pretty much your standard fare. Spoiler alert, just camera pans up, there's the ghost boy, he's still with us. But I really enjoyed this movie, I'm a sucker for Lindsay. Oh boy, so you thought Freak Show, 1989 was bad. Well, here's an even worse horror anthology from 1989, but with a much better title. That's Rock a Die Baby. Rock a Die Baby, that's right. The title's the best thing about it. Uh, not without its laughs, though. It's dedicated to Papa Paul, who showed us how. Starts off, you know, this agent is reassuring his boss over the phone that this shitty band's gonna get a horror movie song done. He tells him, you know, the pressure's on. The band's name is Danger. And they do this video for a really shitty song called Spooky Lady. Uh, all the meanwhile, there's a woman with a tiger named Anton hanging out in this graveyard. But that's not the only bookend. There's also this mom reading stories to her daughter. Like I said earlier, classic cop-out horror anthology bookend. Someone reads to somebody. First story focuses on these wacky misogynistic Vietnam troops who find a corpse with a severed arm. You got Death by Beach. More penis biting on the show. The story really does not have an ending. It does have Viet Cong vampires. Sucks. Not good. Story two. Uh, obnoxious college kids, you know, playing strip poker, pounded brewskis. They try to play a ghost prank on this straight-laced student. Uh, takes a sharp turn. Uh, there's a defiantly non-pentagram-looking star shape drawn on someone's boobies. All hell breaks loose. Has yet another non-ending, but a much more entertaining story. And this last story, good god. The mom from the bookends describes her, like, exhibitionistic honeymoon cab shag to her daughter. Because that's the kind of story kids want to hear, right? About the time that you conceived them in the back of a taxi cab while a greasy dude looked on. Uh, turns out she has a garlic allergy, and her iron-deficient Jack Lemon, Tim Robbins-looking fucking husband... Turns out, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm, okay, Tales from the Crypt. This is that fucking episode with Beverly D'Angelo. Remember that one? With the, you know, oh, to my parents are monsters. This is the same story. I don't know what to tell you. You know, this is one of those movies that ends with the greatest hits montage of clips from the movies. There's, there's like, no real conclusion to anything in the story. Not even the bookends. Like, nothing happens to the band. Their sleazy manager never happens again. What the fuck? This is like the Debbie Does Dallas of anthology horror films. Utter crap. We're gonna move on into the 1990s here. Talk about a French anthology horror film called Adrenaline. Now, this movie is way better than Rock a Die, Baby. I actually like this movie a lot. It's got these black and white segues in it with slow motion pan shots over blind people people sort of forming lines. Uh, the stories in here kind of range. Some of them are more serious. A lot of them are pretty goofy. There's a really effective one early on that's genuinely claustrophobic, where a woman has a nightmare about her ceiling crushing her. Guy fights a killer bottle. There's a pre-saw deadly trap game just to rent a room. And you know, most of the sketches are overtly comedic. Uh, there's this TV story with a couple that kind of starts off like that chiller story with a reporter seduction, you know, gets a little crazier. Got a security camera spider bot uh, versus a night watchman. There's a really great grotesque boxing segment with this absurd punchline. Director Alan Roback made one of the stories, also did Baby Blood from 1990. Adrenaline. I really liked it. Check it out. Well, let's talk about another crazy movie here. That's The German Chainsaw Massacre. 
also known as Blackest Heart from 1990. Okay, so this is directed by Christoph Schlingenzief. And this guy was, the only way I can describe him, as I said to a friend, sort of a proto shit poster. Made a lot of really satirical, over the top, grotesque work. Uh, this film was made, was literally written and completed within three weeks of the German reunification on October 3rd, 1990. It was really controversial at that time to be critical of the reunification, but Schlingenzief kind of had to push the buttons. You know, he had recently seen Toby Hooper's first two Texas Chainsaw films, and the images were lingering in his mind. He could only see a grim irony in it. This led to a screenplay about the problems of a quote-unquote cultural nation, where East German tourists are being killed and eaten by a savage West German family. And, uh, you know, there's a dancing Adolf Hitler in a dream sequence, and other references to Nazism throughout that aren't just sort of empty provocations, but ugly reminders of a past that can't be buried, and sort of symbols of the director's skepticism. There are a lot of people you'll recognize in the cast, several Fassbender regulars like Udo Kier, Volker Spengler, Erm Herrmann, you've got Alfred Adel, who was in Fear of Fear, but other films like Supermarket, part-time work of a domestic slave. This is just a really funny, really crazy, over-the-top movie. Highly recommended from this viewer. Now, a film that's not as great, but one that I liked a lot, Wheels of Terror, 1990. This is a TV movie filmed in Arizona for budgetary reasons. Uh, you got Joanna Cassidy starring in this movie. Underrated actress from The Laughing Policeman, The Night Child, The Glove. I don't know, this is uh, basically one of those movies like uh, The Car by Elliot Silverstein, or Trucks. It opens up with this uh, dad on the side of the road getting iced in front of his daughter by a reckless driver. And, you know, meanwhile, there's another woman who just moved to this small Arizona town with her daughter. She's going to be the school bus driver, but the guy's, like, installing a racing engine in the short bus. Uh, there's some sort of Karen-like vague racism from this woman who keeps calling the guy named Luis Carlos, which is actually the actor's real name. Uh, so maybe that was an onset goof, or maybe she's just a racist. Who knows? But anyway, a cop gets decimated by this ghost driver pedophile dude who you never see. The whole movie, like the whole second half of this movie is basically like an extended 40 to 50 minute car chase. You know, come on, I can't hate that. You got an exploding gas station and a really, really sketchy stunt with a kid hanging out the bus window right above the death mobile underneath him. If you like car movies, Wheels of Terror, check it out. Next film here is a classic. I don't have too much to say about it. That's 1991, Silence of the Lambs, Jonathan Demme. I saw this film theatrically for the 30th anniversary, and I brought a couple of my friends along. Uh, my friend Jordan, who actually had never seen the film, and his girlfriend Jasmine, who thought she hadn't seen the film, hadn't been to the theater in like over a decade and realized about halfway through the film that she had in fact seen it. So it was cool watching that movie theatrically with someone who had never seen it before and someone who hadn't been to the movies in a long time. Uh, they both enjoyed the movie. We had a lot of fun. So that's all I'll say about that. And ugh, speaking of all you have to say, let's hear from this guy Jason Mortensen again. That's Jason with an E Mortensen talking about... It's the Raising Cane. De Palma is a genius. Honestly, sometimes he can be a little overrated. And I don't know if it's because he was stifled as a director. I don't know if it's because he got in his own head and ruined shit on his own. One thing I can say is Raising Cain has always been a real surreal movie that has given me weird feelings. Um, when I was a kid and it came out... It just, it always felt weird watching it. It gave me weird feelings inside. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Is this really happening? Like, mm. watching the director's cut and hearing the story behind the director's cut was really kind of cool. As hearing a director giving credit to a fan and then releasing a fan's edit the way that he did, pretty awesome. But overall, this movie, this bizarre juxtaposition of corny campy what the fuck am i watching with holy shit what is that shot i've never seen anything like that before that is amazing this guy deserves to have his work displayed in an art museum long after he's dead and the soundtrack fucking slaps in that bro that's right bro the soundtrack does slap so that was our final appearance from Jason Mortensen, and yes, he is 100% correct. This movie is incredibly good. I put off watching it for a long time. Admittedly, still have not seen the theatrical cut, but now that I've seen the quote-unquote recut, director's cut, I would love to see the theatrical cut. Next up, we got a shot on video anthology horror film called Scary Tales from 1993. Made in God's favorite place, Baltimore. 
USA. You got a red-eyed boogeyman for the interludes reading stories to kids, but uh, I don't mind this guy reads stories to someone bookend because you got a red-eyed boogeyman. That's fucking cool. First story, Satan's necklace. Uh, you got a cop going through this divorce talking to his friend in a bar that's obviously someone's wood paneled basement. Uh, you know, someone's head catches on fire from a devil's mouth spew. Pretty groovy. Second story, Sliced in Cold Blood. Uh, same actor as in all the stories, which is a pretty fun novelty and also just, you know, a good way to make a film for five bucks. I've been there, done that. Uh, you got a waterbed with a backboard. You don't see that very often. Cheating wife leads to a machete revenge spree. This is basically like a Tim Ritter story. Pretty groovy. Last story, Level 20 one. A video game tester neglects his son and ends up in an IRL RPG. Scary Tales. Awesome movie. <laughs> Next up, The Gifted from 1993. This was directed by Audrey King Lewis, and that's her only writer, director, producer credit. Uh, this is a really great film, really undervalued. You can watch it on YouTube, and I highly recommend it. Uh, it starts off with this DJ talking on a boombox, setting up the film's plot, asking listeners if they believe in aliens and supernatural African beliefs. There's some really cool animation over the opening credits as these fireballs hit ancient Earth, and uh, a spirit gets this woman in bed. At the same time, the king of the Dogon tribe visits another man in his home. So we flash back to childhood where this girl, Lisa, who the spirit caught in bed, she learned that she had this gift. And this other guy had the gift too. Like, he sees blue flames around a man at church's head. Basically, the, the, the mythology is that, like, every 32 or 33 years or something, these, uh, these spirits come around and steal the souls of people. And there's these magical gourds that grow round when this is going to happen. And uh, a lot of people maybe had difficulty keeping up with the plot here, but no, I thought this was a really, really great movie. Uh, really underrated. Would love, love, love to see a Blu-ray of this. Vinegar Syndrome, where you at? Uh, some recognizable actors here. Uh, Dick Anthony Williams. Uh, you got Johnny Secca, J.A. Preston, Davis Roberts, Ed Cambridge, and of course, my favorite, the underrated Julius Harris. He was in tons of great films. Uh, Nothing But a Man, Superfly, Black Caesar, Live and Let Die, The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, Shrunken Heads. So yeah, watch, watch The Gifted on YouTube. That's an amazing movie. It does have some pretty nutty Christianity bullshit in it, but it does feel authentic in its insanity. Check it out. I like it. Gonna move from the 90s into the 2000s now. We're getting close to the end of the show. Another anthology horror film, it's Terror Tracked from 2000. This movie rules. I put off watching this for a long time, and I don't know why, but I'm glad I've finally seen it, because I loved it. Uh, the intro scene, the bookend, shows literally the ugly underbelly of the suburbs in this kind of blue velvet-esque pan through grass and insects. You know, John Ritter is trying to sell a couple a house, but he has to give full disclosure and tell them the heinous history of the houses. First story is about this adulterous wife and her shotgun-toting husband, and features a literal rug pull. They always say that, oh, there's a rug pull in this movie. Well, there's an actual rug pull in this movie. Somebody pulls the rug out from under somebody. Second story, Brian Cranston battles an evil monkey that his daughter found in the backyard. Uh, the monkey kills the family dog. There's like this weird earringed food store clerk with really bizarre facial hair who looks like a character from a Jody Hill movie. And Brian Cranston acts the fuck out of the story. He's like, I'm gonna get that monkey! Amazing. Third story, sort of a precognition granny killer witness goes to see his shrink, tries to save her. But it's too late in the final twist. Hilarious wraparounds, man. John Ritter, the late, great John Ritter. Like I said, real estate agent. Co-writer, director Clint Hutchinson. He was an effects editor on The Lost Boys and Dream Warriors. He would work again with co-director Lance Dreesen on a film called Big Bad Wolf in 2006. But oddly enough, Dreesen's last directorial credit was a Christian film with Dean Cain called The Way Home. Now, I haven't seen The Way Home, but I guarantee you it doesn't have Brian Cranston fighting a killer monkey in it and going, Damn you, evil monkey! Next up, it's I Can See You from 2008, filmed in Wilmington, Delaware. Directed by Graham Resnick. This was his only feature, but he's made several short films. He also did uh, all eight episodes of a show called Dead Wax for Shudder. Speaking of indie films, you got director Larry Fessenden, who acts in this film as Mickey Hauser, a cleaning product TV salesman. You know, he helped produce the film. And uh, this is this is an interesting little movie. I didn't think it was great. Uh, it's got its pros and cons. There's some awkward amateur acting in it, but that's both a pro and a con in a way. Like, it's positive because it veers toward the intentional detachment sort of artificiality that the lack of story is aiming for but it's also negative in that it kind of places a heavy reliance on dialogue that hampers the more experimental side of the film and just kind of ends up feeling you know a little half-baked but uh, there's some really effective cramped medium shots in this film occasionally they're a little clumsy like some of the woods shots almost look like green screen and this is one of those i hate to say this but mumble corer 
you know, films like Mumblecore Horror, Mumblecore. You heard it here first, folks. Like Baghead and Toad Road and shit like that. But I think this is a little better than those movies. Uh, interesting use of overlays in this night sex scene. There's a really good blurry swimming scene where the character is uncomfortable because he can't see without his glasses. And you know, this movie is ambitious, even if it's not like immaculately crafted. There's several genuinely eerie scenes, like that montage of the guy's bungled photographs with the weird smoke in them. But there is a really great mindfuck climax with you know eye gouging and brain picking. Uh, most viewers might find themselves annoyed with the film because it's pretty open-ended. I thought I can see it was good. Speaking of weird mindfuck nonsense independent movies, I watched The Oregonian from 2011 and The Procedure, a short film from 2016, both directed by Calvin Lee Reader. That name sounds familiar. He played Sweet Benny on the Jerk Beast show and movie. He's uh, made a lot of other stuff. He directed a film called The Rambler in 2013 that he adapted from his 2008 short. had Dermot Mulroney and Natasha Lyonne in it. And uh, The Oregonian, this is an interesting movie. Uh, parts of it were filmed in Washington, Lind, Ravensdale, Seattle. It's got a really interesting sound design in the film. I like that. It kind of weaves in recognizable noises like a heart monitor and that pomp and circumstance graduation song. But these noises kind of intentionally feel contextually out of place, which makes them pretty unnerving. Like you don't know why you're hearing it. And it does kind of get under your skin a little. There's an extended peeing scene where a guy's pee turns into blood, then it turns into ink. You got people drinking gasoline, humping glass doors. I saw somebody describe this movie as a trailer trash fever dream. I'd say that's pretty accurate. And this film, I think, succeeds where I can see you fails by deliberately avoiding characterization and dialogue, which leaves little quote-unquote acting for the performers, and they can just sort of focus more on uncertain editing rhythms and unpredictable images, which really make the film a little stronger. And I can sort of hesitantly recommend this film, but I can unhesitantly recommend The Procedure by Calvin Lee Reader, a short film he made in 2016. It's like four minutes. You can see it on YouTube, and all that I will tell you about it, a man gets abducted for an experiment. That's it. Just watch. Just watch. This is important filmmaking. The Procedure, 2016, Calvin Lee Reader. It's on YouTube important filmmaking. So now we're down to the last straw, folks. It's been a long show. I'd like to thank everybody for coming on, uh, but we're going to wrap it up here and talk about a new film, Titan, from 2021. Wow, what a great movie. This just came out. It's still in theaters. Go see it. I cannot recommend this movie enough. Best film that I've seen this year. Best film that probably came out last year. It's directed by Julia DeCournau, who made Raw several years ago. Now, this film was more effective for me personally than that one. I think it's an interesting film. I'd like to revisit it now that I've seen Titan. Great movie. And... Uh, there's some really brutal stuff in it. I've heard a lot of complaints about it. Some people say that, oh, it's really just two stories. It's not like a, it doesn't feel like one coherent narrative. It's like two different stories. Well, you know, the, the quote-unquote two stories blended pretty fucking well together for me. I thought it was great. There's some really nasty violence in this movie. There's a scene that reminded me of Dogtooth a little bit. And, you know, it's nobody makes good trailers for movies anymore. I recently saw somebody saying something like, Oh, man, uh, trailers are at their peak. Every movie looks great. And I'm like, do you even watch movies? Every time I go to the theater now, it's like the majority of the trailers are awful. And even the movies that I end up liking have bad trailers. So the trailer for Titan was great. And it's the rare great trailer trailer that refuses to hold an audience's hand doesn't tell you much about the film and we sort of live in this over-advertised age of pablum and even mediocre sneak peeks at good movies so great trailer great movie de Cornell actually co-directed this kind of obscure 2012 movie called mange which is available on youtube but the english subtitles are kind of spotty and you know there has been a little bit of a debate about this film it's not for everyone it's really it's pretty gruesome you know despite all the provocative shocks i do think that this is a warm film with a somewhat positive outlook uh, and it's just a hell of a ride getting there so titan go see it while it's still in theaters i highly recommend it and it looks like that's gonna wrap it up for the 19th episode of video psychosis our halloween 2021 edition once again, I'd like to thank all my guests. Do another quick plug for The Lonely Dream of Death. Check that out currently on YouTube. And stay tuned for the 20th episode of Video Psychosis coming soon. But for now, 